you. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the November 17th um, meeting of the Park and Recreation Commission. And just to note that right now there is a beautiful moon outside. So if you have a chance to look out the window, you should do that. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, Lam, could you take the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Chair Cribs? Here. Vice Chair Greenfield? Here. Commissioner Moss? Here. Commissioner Recknall? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner LaMare? Not present. And we also join now by um, uh, Council Liaison, uh, Lydia Koo. Yes, here. Good evening, uh, Council Member Koo. Thank you as usual for joining us. Um, are there any agenda changes, requests, or deletions to tonight's agenda? Okay, I don't hear any. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to anything not on the agenda tonight? Chair, I see no hands. Great, thank you. Okay, well, that moves us um, to the department report. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, I'm Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. I've got a couple updates for you this evening. Uh, on the topic of Coverly, I've got a couple. We've got a resurfacing of the Coverly tennis courts that's scheduled for spring of 2022. Uh, the Palo Alto Soccer Club has started their annual seasonal lighting for the Coverly turf field on November 7th, and they have the use of the lights for practices Monday through Friday, 5.30 p.m. through 8.30 p.m., and that will extend through March 11th. Um, one commissioner question was about when council will discuss the Measure E site at Bixby. That hasn't been scheduled yet. I don't believe it's on their agenda. So I will keep checking in with Public Works to see if that's something that's gonna be scheduled. And when it is, I'll be sure to let the commission know. Uh, the capital budget planning process has started informally. We have not heard from the City um, Office of Management and Budget, which is in charge of the capital budget. And they have not released a schedule for the timeframes for submittals. However, the Community Services Department and Public Works Engineering staff are now working on it, preparing and getting things ready. LAMA will be scheduling a time for the ad hoc committee to meet with staff um, early next week, hopefully. We'll get that out. We'll be meeting soon to discuss uh, different projects and timeframes. The second annual Jacko Jaunt event was held on Friday, October 29th at Linton Plaza. It was a very successful event. There were 62 jack o lanterns submitted and 550 viewers throughout the event. The Junior Museum and Zoo opened on November 12th to high demand with almost 5,000 tickets sold for November and December dates. 312 memberships have been sold since November 1st and all available tickets in November have been sold out. The JMZ is currently open Friday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and will open Tuesday through Sunday starting December 21st. And you can learn more on cityofpaloalto.org forward slash JMZ. There's a tree lighting ceremony that will be held at Lytton Plaza on Friday, December 3rd from 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. And it will include an in-person tree lighting, youth performances, holiday snacks and crafts. There's a holiday decorating uh, contest. Applications must be completed online by December 14th and awards will be announced December 23rd. The Children's Theater first main stage production just opened in November and sold out with waiting lists for tickets and classes are running uh, fully enrolled, most with waiting lists. There's an Art Center Studio holiday sale it will take place December 4th through 5th and the Winter Enjoy catalog will be mailed to Palo Alto residents the first week of December. At our October meeting, we had an agenda item regarding creation of an ad hoc committee for the Measure E site at Bixby Park, and I was tasked with confirming what the city's process will be for boards and commissions to add things to their council approved work plans. Uh, I've spoken with CSD director Kristen O'Kane about this and she's looking into the matter and I'll update the commission as soon as I have more information about that. The city clerk's office informed me that the interviews for the Parks and Recreation Commission applicants will be held on November 22nd. 
and the appointments of the members will be held on December 13th. We have 15 applicants and the city council agenda from November 8th has a staff report with the applications of all the applicants. The grand opening and ribbon cutting ceremony for the Highway 101 pedestrian and bike bridge is scheduled to take place on Saturday, November 20th at 10 a.m., weather permitting. The event begins with a speaker program at 10 a.m. on the Baylands side of the bridge, and ribbons will be cut on both sides of the bridge entrances on the East and West Bayshore roads. An ice cream truck will be also be available for all. A very brief update on pickleball staff, the ad hoc committee and members of the Palo Alto Pickleball Club board members met on November 4th to discuss collaborating on cleaning the courts and keeping them looking their best. And just wanted to note how uh, the club was really helpful and willing to help work with staff and coordinate with us to keep the courts clean and improve how, how we're currently maintaining them. And Chair, this concludes the department report. Wow, well, I apologize. You must have seen me jumping around. I was totally losing battery power with my computer and I think I have fixed it. So I would ask that the vice chair be standing by just in case you totally lose me. So I have stopped panicking now and um, it sounded, <laughs> sounded like a great report. Um, could I ask uh, any commissioners have any uh, additional questions for Darren? I, I don't see any, but thank you very much for that. Um, Council Member Koo, do you have any comments or questions? No, thank you for asking. Okay, so um, that moves us then to the adoption of the resolution authorizing the use of teleconferencing for Parks and Recreation Commission meetings during the COVID-19 state of emergency. And that's an action. And there was an attachment in, uh, to the agenda. Darren, could you give us a little more background on that? If we need Sure, yes. Under a new state law, local boards and commissions need to adopt certain findings every 30 days beginning in November in order to continue meeting remotely without following the traditional teleconference rules in the Brown Act. City Council has been doing this since November 1st. Each board and commission needs to do their own and we'll need to do this again at our de December meeting. The commission will need to make this motion to approve it and then do the, vo the voice vote for this chair. Okay, could we have a motion to approve, please? I actually, I have a question. Uh, do we need to have, a, have the same motion repeated in December when we'll be meeting less than 30 days from now? Yes. So it, so it doesn't just cover everything for 30 days? We, I was told we need to do it at each meeting. Okay. And, and, and the re, I, I would understand if we had standing committees that were meeting during the month that, would, that were subject to the Brown Act, it would make sense why we need to do that. But otherwise, it doesn't really make sense, but happy to do it if that's what we need to do. I think and I'll, I'll make a motion to, uh, to uh, that we move forward with this as Thank written. You. Thank you. And is there a second? Second. And um, Lam, could you take a um, voice vote, please? Yes. Chair Cribs? Yes. Vice Chair Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Regdahl? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. And Commissioner Lamare is absent currently. So we have a vote of five. Four, five, four. <laughs> the the the, top, the hybrid meeting. Great, thank you very much. And so then we'll do this again at our December meeting, and then I'm assuming we'll all be in person. Um, Darren, is that correct? In January. In January, that's the tentative plan. Yes. When we see how things work out. And, okay. and Chair, just to reiterate, this would be a hybrid meeting, so we'll be in person. The public can attend um, remotely yeah. if they choose. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So let's move on to the mission, the minutes and the approval of the, of the minutes. I had one very minor thing, but it was hard to fix it on the last page, um, about halfway down, uh, where it notes that Council Member Koo affirmed that this is a very fun committee. If we could move that sentence up to above the following, the, the, the paragraph above that, because we were talking about the um, 
uh, the applicants for the um, commission for next term. And we said that it was a very fun committee or a very fun commission. And maybe, you know, that's why we have so many applicants. And then we went into the discussion of the film festival. And then uh, Council Member Ku affirmed that it was a very fun committee. So it's confusing about whether the film festival, which is probably very fun, um, and also the applications um, are very, the commission is very fun. So if we could just have that, do you see where that is in the minutes? The last page. I could send it to you if you like. That'd be great. I think we can get that. Okay, it, it, you'll spot it right away. So thank, thank you very much for indulging me in that. Um, yeah, I see, and, and, and we'll make we'll make note of that change. Okay, is there a motion to um, pass the minutes to adopt them? Move to adopt the minutes. Thank you, and a second? Second. Thank you, and a voice vote, Lam, please. Yes, uh, Chair Cribs. Yes. Vice Chair Greenfield. Yes. Commissioner Moss. Yes. Commissioner Recknell. Yes. And Commissioner Brown. Yes. It's a vote five zero. Great, thank you. Okay, um, moving now to our ad hoc um, and liaison updates for this past month. Um, I, before I start just calling for people to um, fill in a, out a report, um, last time I was, was noting that both the Baylands tie gate and the, um, sidewalk, sidewalk vendor policy. Yes. Uh, had been recommended that maybe those go to a liaison status rather than a, um, ad hoc committee because they've essentially done most of their job. And so Darren, I didn't know whether we have to send that on for permission or we can just go ahead and do that and see if one of the members of um, both the sidewalk and the um, Baylands Tidegate would be willing to act as the liaison. How do we handle that? Yeah, I think we can just make the call, I believe. But, uh, if we're not quite sure or you've got more questions about that, I'm glad to check with the clerk's office. But I don't recall any vote for disbanding ad hocs in the past. Um, that's the call. Let's assume that we don't have any need to vote. And um, if we could just ask the Baylands Tidegate, uh, one of the members, if they would like to, to be the liaison for that uh, subject, that would be either um, Keith or Jeff, vice chair. Any takers on that one? I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you very much. And then on the sidewalk uh, vendor, we'll do the same thing. So um, Mandy, Jeff, or David. I'm happy to be the liaison. Thank you very much. Okay, and then Alam in our sheet that we work from, could you rearrange the, um, the assignments, please? Not, not not this minute, but at some point for the future. Yes, I will. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay. Then starting with the CIP review, David. Uh, no, uh, no change. We are waiting for a uh, meeting. Yeah, I think I heard that while I was trying to figure out how to make my computer work. So thank you. Um, the dog park and restroom from my end, we have not been able to have a meeting with the dog um, community. And I'm assuming the restrooms are proceeding uh, per, the, per the plan. Mandy? That's my understanding as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Darren, any um, addition about the, the restrooms, any, any progress? You know, I think we'll have more information as we dig into the the CIP conversation chair, and I'll be able to get fresher timelines and anticipated times for the different restroom projects we've got. Okay, great. Um, Foothills Nature Preserve, I know we have a report coming up to the council, um, but uh, perhaps vice chair has additional information from the ad hoc. Sure, on, on Foot Foothills Nature Preserve uh, ad hoc continues to meet regularly uh, 
um, we're, and we're working towards uh, presenting uh, at the December meeting. Great. I don't know if there's anything uh, beyond that, that that we need to add at this point. The other members could chime in. No. No, David. Keith, anything? Uh, nothing of interest. Okay. Um, the fund development committee, um, Jeff is not here yet. Um, and there, that's on the agenda for later on. So why don't we um, pass that? And the same with the new recreational opportunities specifically about the gym, since that's on the agenda. Um, the racket court policy, Keith or Mandy? Mm -hmm. We did have that one meeting with the pickleball group to talk about the court cleaning, but apart from that, nothing new. Okay, and then if I understand it from an email, um, Adam is doing a complete review, maybe later on in the spring of court policy to answer some questions. Is that what I'm hearing or? Check chair. I think it was more that there were agreements that were coming up and there was part of a, a just a natural review of the court usage okay. policy. Um, he probably knows better than me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there also was that one, you, the USTA right now has a monopoly. I mean, I'm just, they're the only court, they're the only group that can reserve spaces mm -hmm. and we'll be looking to broaden that. Okay. That's great news. Thank you for that. Um, and the sidewalk vendor has moved to a liaison status. Uh, moving on to the liaisons in um, terms of- uh, Chair. Did I miss one? Can I go back? No, can I go back to the CIP and mention one thing? Yes, of course. <clears throat> um, there was discussion um, about the, pro the general process, CIP process, and whether or not um, we could, uh, whether or not fundraising would have an impact on the process and whether or not we uh, could or should fundraise for some of the CIPs that have not even yet been approved for this year. And the, the bottom line was that um, we can think about it um, and, and start preparing, but really until there's the first preliminary list of CIPs, <clears throat> there's not much we can do. Okay, so, so more, to come, more to come on that? Yes, more to come on that. Okay, great, thank you. So um, going to aquatics, um, we will have the report from Tim Sheeper and uh, in January. Um, we, we have had a, a very good meeting um, with the lap swimmers. Um, Vice Chair, maybe you care to comment at this point or shall I go ahead? Please go ahead, you are the aquatic liaison. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, yes, at, at any rate, um, the lap swimmers um, have, formed um, un, kind of an unofficial support group for uh, Rinconada and for swimmers. And um, I was actually really pleased to hear that the spirit of cooperation that exists and the, the desire to be partners to make uh, the swimming experience um, better while it's good now because of COVID, there's some been some additional protocols and um, everybody's watching that. So um, I think it's really good that the different community groups and who leaves the pool and the different stakeholders are, are talking and um, Sheeper seems to be very receptive to a discussion. So um, we're looking forward to getting the report um, in January. Anything else to add, Jeff? I, I would just add that the, it, it's, it seems like more than an informal group, they've organized pretty well and uh, they have a, a name to their group and a, a, a list of members and all. Yeah, that you know that that's right. Um, I, I meant 
I meant informal in terms of, you know, with no bylaws and rules and all of that. So it's just a, perceptor, a perspective matter. So I think it's fine. And um, priorities and, and the, so. Yeah. Okay, the next one is um, the Balance 10.5 and that's mine as well. Um, I have reached out a couple of times to the new president of the Palo Alto Soccer Club and we've traded emails about some ad additional people to include in a potential meeting, but we've not set anything. So I expect that to happen in the next um, couple of weeks, at least having a conversation. Uh, community gardens, Mandy. I don't have any updates unless Darren, you have anything to add. Only that we're we're hopeful to be filling Catherine Borkwin's position soon, and she's mm -hmm. been managing that program. And so, in her absence, uh, Lam and I are doing the best we can, um, and with great support from the community garden liaisons. Great. Okay, moving to Cubberly. Um, yeah, it, things are continuing along uh, after uh, we talked last month about um, Coverly being used uh, while Hoover and Palo Verde are being updated. And uh, since the meeting uh, and since that announcement, there's been a lot of pushback by parents, uh, um, but it's moving along. Uh, Keith, have you heard anything else about from PAUSP? No, the meeting is on Thursday, so we haven't had a meeting since the last Parks and Rec meeting. Council Member Ku, anything else uh, about Coverly that we should know at this point? Um, no, I think uh, David, um, Commissioner Moss just um, kind of reported in terms of the um, schools, uh, it's going to be their temporary site. Yes, no, there isn't any more. We are trying to get a joint meeting together, but it might be too soon. A joint council and uh, PAUSD study session, um, but that's not firmed up yet. Okay. Would, okay. Thank you. Um, field users? Vice Chair Greenfield? Yes, uh, I, I met uh, with some members of Palo Alto Soccer Club at Coverly Field, uh, discussed some adjustments to the temporary lights, uh, which have been made. Uh, we also discussed some field permit issues that they've had and staff has helped, helped sort these out. Uh, also talked about the, the issues of field conditions at the, uh, at the Stanford Soccer Complex Mayfield uh, playing fields and at El Camino Park. And this is the this is a couple of different things uh, at, at both sites. It's issues of the turf infill material melting. And at El Camino Park, there's also issues of lines and seams and penalty penalty mark uh, the lifting up and, and no longer being present. Uh, and I've spoken with with the with staff about this. Uh, the issue on the the lines uh, at El Camino Park sounds like something that we will be able to address quickly, uh, get, getting to glue in some new lines, or or glue glue back in the existing lines. The issue with the addressing the fields is a is a matter of concern. We're we're, we're moving forward with with getting materials, but the timing. Uh, the timeline for all this is is drawn out and, and is a matter of concern. And the final issue that we discussed was uh, the temporary restroom that's at Coverly. Uh, right now there's one porta potty there and the club was asking if they could have a second one put in at, at their expense to, to address the, the load, the, uh, the needs at, at times. And, and this is something that they can move forward with, but the, the, this raised the issue of the t the permanent uh, restrooms that are that have been planned for Coverly and approved over over two years ago, and uh, would really like to see how we can move that uh, the implementation and construction of these uh, forwards to to address this uh, legitimate need. Wow. 
Is there um, any oh. timeline regarding the potential restrooms at Coverly, the permanent ones? My understanding is that it, the, it's the pacing item right now is getting uh, the public works department to uh, get the plans finalized so they can go through ARB and get uh, approved. Uh, and Darren, please feel free to comment further on that. I think you got it right, Vice Chair. Um, and as I mentioned a little earlier, I think this applies to the field restroom at Coverly too. As we look at all the CIPs, I'll be able to get fresh information on timelines for things like this one when we're going to make it happen. There's always a little bit of shuffling as the CIP season comes up and we reprioritize when things are going to happen. But as we've talked on this subject, this one's been languishing for a long time and needs to move forward as soon as we can. And, and I, I know and appreciate that there are other restroom projects that are that are in the in the queue for, for Ramos and for uh, What's, what's Bullware? the other part? Bullware. Bullware, yes, thank you. Uh, and I, I think it's really important to, to separate them and move, uh, get the Coverly one done as quickly as possible rather than trying to do them uh, in bulk because Coverly has been out there the longest and as, as we've been waiting for this quite a long time. So that's my recommendation and hope. Is there anything that we should do as a commission to try to get some attention? Perhaps when we, first of all, I'll convey this to the public works engineering team and the, the rest of the CIP review folks on the city side. So they all know that that's our interest. Staff shares that interest. It's just a matter of sure. limited staff and a lot of projects um, as usual with these kind of things, but we'll do our best. And then also when we hopefully come to the full commission to discuss this, we can reiterate that sentiment. Um, the commission can just vocalize that. And again, we'll help share those that comment and feedback with the rest of the team. So Darren, um, can, can you give us an idea of how long the process will take? Let's, we have to get the plans from public works and then they go to the ARB and then they go someplace else and then they start building. So what do you think the time frame is? You know, I, I don't feel prepared to answer that right now. We had an estimated time and um, we passed it. So I am reluctant to, to throw that out now. So I'll double check and make sure when we come to the, either the next department report or the CIPs come for discussion that I've got a, a good answer for you on that one, Chair. Good, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I know it is not, <clears throat> it's not easy and I don't expect you to have the, have the information. I just wanted to get a sense of how, how long that would take um, especially if the soccer groups are asking to have a, another portable installed or two. So thank you. Um, Chair, yes. um, uh, regarding, uh, well, actually vice chair, regarding the um, Coverly lights, I am very happy to see that the footprint is half or even less than what it was last year and the year before the year before. So um, uh, that's uh, a big improvement um, that they can get that much power out of such a small footprint. And uh, I don't know what, um, what prop prompted that change, but that was great. I think one of the differences is that there's no generator included with these lights. It's simply solar panels and battery. But I noticed that the solar panel is really uh, it, 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 sli it slides out. So the right. footprint is actually one panel, but it, you pull it out and it's two panels. Right, yeah. and, and one of the considerations is that, that we, did, we talked about is that are you coming on? the panel needs to be slid up when games are being played. So, the, so it's further away from the playing field and at, at, a, higher, at, at a height that's less likely to uh, be an obstacle and a hazard. Yeah, and I noticed that there, there's a lot more yellow tape uh, than there was uh, uh, a week ago. So uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, yes, we, we, we missed part of what you, I at least missed part of what you said, but yes, the, another change was getting tape and uh, the, the pylon cones placed around all of the, the right. lights. Yeah, yeah, fully half of it was missing a week ago. So now it's now it's all there. Okay. 
vice chair, I think. You're okay, are, are there any other uh, uh, liaisons that haven't re reported? I, I guess I could comment yeah, on, on, on I'm Earth. back. She's back. I'm, I was trying to get Jack on the line and I have him on the line. So um, I, I think we have Goff right now and Jeff Lemaire is not here. Um, the uh, Hawthorne planning area, if anybody, if you can comment about that or- No updates. Um, doesn't look like there's anything else. Um, oh, let's go to the safe routes to school. Nothing. No updates. Uh, skateboard park. Uh, that would be, oh, here's Jeff. Well, good. Okay. Um, the, the skateboard park is Jeff Lemaire and we'll be, well, we could chat. Uh, let me see. Darren, could you um, talk a little bit about that for the commission? Sure. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we had a, a meeting with um, Sam, who's been leading the endeavor um, and his team, and we discussed the next steps were to really make sure that the skateboard community was behind this proposed area we've been looking at at Greer Park. And he met independently with his team. We had noted staff right now is, is limited in capacity to keep leading public meetings and, and discussions. And he said, well, I'm glad to do this. And so he led that, which was fantastic, and came back to the chair and I and said, I've built some consensus around this idea. We're in support in general around a, a particular area of Greer Park. And I think the next step is I'm hopeful that Public Works Engineering could, could help manage this. We hold a community meeting. And this would be for all the neighbors and the bigger skateboard community, because we've only really been talking to a small group. And so this would be the, the, wider, the wider skateboard community, neighbors, other sports users, and say, this is what we're thinking. Please give us your feedback. Then we'd come back to the commission and share that. And then that recommendation from the commission would go to the council. Have, yep. you, got, have you gotten a feeling that they would help with fundraising? Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. So I think we're feel like we're making progress. Thank you um, for that, Darren. Um, sustainability, Mandy, anything? The sustainability climate action plan meetings are ongoing. Um, the latest was electrical vehicles. All the materials and presentations are on the website if anybody wants to look at it. And the next meeting is December 9th on mobility. Does, um, do you have any conversations or any um, relationship with the Bay Area Council and their sustainability action plan? I mean, do, do our, our different groups sharing that information or hooked into each other? I know there are a variety of groups that have meetings on this. I don't know that, that specific one, but I can check in with Christine. Thank you. Um, urban forestry, anything? Uh, I, been yes, uh, just simply, we'll, we'll be scheduling a meeting between staff, with staff and the PRC liaisons, uh, Keith and myself, to review the details of the PRC urban, urban forestry relationship. Okay, thank you. Ventura plan, Keith? Nothing new out there. And the Youth Council, I continue to try to make the meetings um, and I've been, been not very successful. So I'm hoping that I will be there either next week or the following week. So um, all I can say is that we've got a great group of uh, leaders in the youth community and uh, it's really fun to see them develop their ideas and, and move ahead. So um, that's all I have for the liaison and the um, ad hoc committees. So I think we can move on now to um, the next item on the agenda. And I believe that we're very fortunate that both Roger Smith is on the line from the Friends of the Palo Alto Park and also Jack Morton from the uh, Recreation Foundation. Um, we had we moved them up in the agenda because uh, we wanted to make sure that they had um, uh, a time on the agenda that was convenient for them. Um, I wanted to welcome them back. We remember we had some time to talk with them this summer about both of the foundations. And tonight I wanted to ask them specifically um, two questions and then have, the, uh, have them answer the questions and then have the commissioners um, the opportunity to discuss um, both 
both opportunities. And I'm wondering, um, Lam, for this item, do we need to have, uh, see if there's any members of the public that wish to speak at this point? There are no uh, hands raised at this point. Okay, thank you. So um, Roger Smith, um, I'd like to ask you first, um, and the, the two questions are really, can you both talk about your ability to take contributions through your foundations and what is the focus of your foundation now and your any plans that you have to share for 2022 and then we will go to the commissioners to ask questions so roger um, you're on by phone um, so can you um, talk about taking contributions Roger, are you there? If you could unmute, please. Mm -hmm. And while you're. I actually, I don't, yeah, I do see Roger there. Is there a way for him to unmute? Okay, well, while we get this organized. Um... Anne, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Oh, great. Okay. So, we have, now, we have Roger unmuted now. So, right. uh, let's, let's of all, Roger. Thank you all for, for taking your time uh, uh, on this important uh, issues and, and just keeping Palo Alto a great place to, to live. Uh, we uh, at the Friends of the Palo Alto Parks, one of the reasons we started the the organization 14 years ago was the basic uh, premise that we, the city, would never have enough money to do all the stuff that we would like to do and maybe should do. So right now we have 11 different funds and uh, ranging from different things. Uh, the two that might uh, tie in the best to our discussion tonight would be the Bike Palo Alto Fund and then the Lawn Bowling Fund. And uh, so we are 501c3 and have the ability to uh, open new accounts or new funds for any uh, project that's related to uh, the city that uh, ties into uh, uh, parks and recreation. Um, as far as what we'd like to do next year, we continue after 14 years, not figuring it out, is how we get a hold of some of the mass amount of money that we have in our city and uh, <laughs> how we dig into that and uh, and that that is something that all of us in the nonprofit world is trying to do so that's what we're going to do and we want to continue to work with the uh, Darren and his people that have been very helpful to us uh, to see what areas that we might be able to help in the parks that would be it Dan Okay, well, thank you for all of that. I, I asked um, Darren if he could show on the screen um, your website that shows the different, if you will, buckets that people can contribute money to. So I hope you don't mind, um, but I think it's very well done. And um, commissioners, if you haven't been to this website for a while, you can see um, different ways to donate, special donations as Darren is scrolling down. And then, um, the donation opportunities. And Darren, can you just maybe click on one so we, we can see maybe the ballpark nature plant garden? So it uh, calls out what the project is for and then gives people the opportunity to donate. And um, those buckets exist for each of the projects that are there. Um, so I'm very hopeful that uh, once the skate park comes back to the commission, um, with a, a plan that there will be a box where there's an empty box below the Foothills Nature Preserve that says skate park. And uh, we'll be able to direct, and Sam will be able to direct his people um, to contribute to um, the uh, Friends of the Parks. So um, Roger, thank you for that summary. It was very good. Um, and before we go to Jack, Let's have any of the commissioners ask any questions of Roger that they would that they'd like to um, bring up. So, Vice Chair, start with you. Sure. What, what, I'm interested in, uh, from your opinion, what the most exciting work that your organization has been able to 
to do uh, in the past year. It's been a challenging year for, for sure. Well, we, we have worked uh, very hard with uh, Darren's uh, staff on the uh, on the signage out at the Baylands that's going to run from uh, our, our interpretive center all the way over to Cooley Landing, and it's going to be in uh, English and Spanish. So that's been our big, uh, big uh, project that we've done this past year. That, that's, that's great. That's an exciting one for us, and uh, that that would be our biggest project uh, this past year. Uh, that, that, that's a that's a really important one and, and one that the uh, community and the and the region will be able to enjoy us. Uh, I, I thank you for uh, your, your efforts and your, and your passion. I might just mention, if you don't mind, uh, the, the 501C, our involvement was sort of key for us to get some outside uh, uh, donations. And we, we fronted some of those so we got those in place. And uh, Aaron's people were really imaginative on that, but uh, having the 501c3 uh, able to do some stuff to jumpstart that project. Great. Yes, thank you very much for that. That's really exciting, Roger. Um, other commissioners, Keith? Yeah, so what's the process? We want to add something. Is it we just call up friends of Palo Alto Parks and they add it, or is there some staff approves it, or what's the process? Uh, well, let me answer it first, and then Darren may want to jump in. From our standpoint, we just have to uh, know that it's an honorable project, if you will. And so we're, we're keeper of the money, and then uh, uh, when the money needs to go out, we, we make sure it goes to a proper place. Uh, and uh, so uh, from our standpoint, we're, we're ready. We could open the one tomorrow, if you wish. Yeah, and thanks, Roger, and, and thanks, Commissioner Rechtal, for that good question. Uh, the one sort of caveat <clears throat> comes up with large projects like the skate park one. The question we asked ourselves early on was, well, can we start right now before council approval? Can we have uh, this partnership going and get funds generated? In checking with the city attorney's office, the answer was no, that we do need council approval first for things like that. So I, I would look at it like smaller scale things, if we're gonna fund a drinking fountain, a bench at a given park and we needed extra funds and we wanted to put up something to fund that on, on this page, we could work with Roger and his team and, and see if they'd be willing to support that and that would be fine. But when we come to an asset where the city is gonna be responsible for the maintenance of a long-term asset like a skate park or gym or whatever else, we need council approval before embarking on fundraising for that. Thank you, Darren. Do we have a number? Uh that you think that we have to achieve <laughs> i don't i don't i didn't get that from the attorney but when in doubt i can always check with them so as things arise we can we can see okay that's great that'd be great to great to have a number and good question keith thank you for that i think everybody's interested in how how to make this happen so I think the number is one of those, if you have to ask. <laughs> i know <laughs> okay um uh, mandy do you have any comments for roger or questions no questions, but thanks for the great work and partnership you have with the city. It's essential for having a great community assets like we do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David? Yeah, to follow up on what um, uh, Keith's question and Darren's uh, answer is uh, exactly what I was mentioning before about uh, the chicken and egg kind of thing. Mm -hmm. will, a, will a CIP be uh, moved up in uh, uh, to uh, an earlier year if there is fundraising, um, or do we have to wait to put the CA CIP into a certain year, and then and only then can we fundraise for it? So it's it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Uh, if we could get fundraising, maybe we could we could bring something uh, in sooner. Yeah, to answer that question, Commissioner Moss, yes. Private funds to help support a capital project can both get it onto the five-year plan and potentially move it forward under certain conditions. Um, it's not the only factor, but it is an important one. When there's funding shortages and we've got a share in the cost, 
with something like this via grant or partnership or donation, I have seen that be um, effective in either getting it on the list or, or expediting it. But there are other critical criteria, whether you have the money or not, if you don't have staff to manage it, that will not move it forward. So there are other things that could be problematic. Your second question on the chicken versus egg thing, um, I think that also depends to some degree. The skate park is a good example. We are not planning to have a CIP in place when we go to council and say, you were given, the PRC and staff were given this directive, find the location and see if it fits in the priorities. And then if they approve of that, we can have the fundraising start ahead of there even being a CIP on the city side. So I think it is possible to move forward with fundraising in certain situations, even without one. Okay, and I think even the other example is the pickleball center at Mitchell Park. I don't even think it was a CIP um, ever. It, it just sort of happened and they helped fundraise for it. And so that was a, another example. Okay, well, all, go all good questions. Um, Jeff is not, LaMare is not here. So um, Roger, after you've heard the questions and comments, do you have anything else that you want to um, share with us? Uh, no, I, I guess from our side, we're very flexible. And, uh, and I was just thinking as uh, Darren talked, there may be a sort of an in-between thing to think about if we could legally have uh, non-binding pledges or something be, that might help us uh, get to see if there's enough money out there. So, but we're, we're flexible and would love to have an account uh, for the skate park and any other ones. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Keith? What happens if we raise money for a skate park and we just don't get enough and the project dies? What happens to that money? Roger, did you hear the question? I did. I guess that, uh, uh, like our friend Larry Stone, who uh, is our assessor in San Jose, yeah. he ra raised money for his campaign, and then no one ra uh, ran against him, so he sent us all a check back. So I think one of the things that could be <laughs> that uh, the money goes back to the, uh, to the uh, recipient uh, you, you might get into a little problem tax-wise. You get in a big problem tax-wise. So. That, that may be where, uh, depending on timing, that we do, that we think about a pledge that, uh, that, uh, that, would, that would be another thing. But, but I, I, the, the other part of this is I was thinking, it seems to me that uh, in my world, I think there should be a Friends of the Skate Park Fund for maybe not the re, the whole redo, but clearly there's probably some things that come up with, over time that could be funded too. So that's another another. Um, can I chime in on that problem? You could chime in um, because okay. I think we're just about, Jack. I think we're just about finished with with Roger and questions. But I think Roger should be button. Roger should be there to counter me. So, huh? so I'm, I'm going to talk as an accountant and not as a competing 501c3. So, Roger, for, I think for your information, and you can sort it out, when someone gives to a 501c3, they get a tax deduction. Oftentimes, it's the primary reason they give. But if the 501c3 has a change of focus or a change of project, that money is the 501c3s. It, it made a commitment to raise money for that thing, but the money stays with the nonprofit. I mean, you under very rare circumstances, do unless you have a contract. And if you have a contract for that sort of thing, you really don't have a contribution. You the contribution to a nonprofit is given with an understanding of what the nonprofit does, but you don't, you know, it's not like you put money down on a, a construction project and the construction project doesn't occur. You donate it to the friends of the parks 
and this was we what we expected to do it but and the courtesy probably requires but unless if you have a contract you don't have a contribution so the contribution the moment it passes from them to you belongs to the nonprofit so i would think the issue of raising money you I mean, you're not going to lose that money or you shouldn't be losing that money because they've probably already taken the, the IRS and the state of California contribution. So it feels like that is something that is um, not exactly part of this discussion tonight um, when you accountants get involved in things. No, but it's very so important. I, it, it is very important. You're absolutely right. I would prefer to, and you'll all laugh at this, I would prefer to be confident that we would raise enough money to cover the state skate park and wouldn't have to, to deal with one of these um, problems coming up in the future. So if we could move to the questions about the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation, are you okay with that, Jeff? Jack? Oh, sir. So, the two questions that we talked about were, um, tell us about the foundation's ability to make contributions and the focus of your foundation, which as we understand it, and we've always talked about is more pro uh, programmatic and recreation-based rather than capital. And what are your plans for 2022 as we all hopefully come out of COVID? And let me just preface that with great thanks for all of the funding that you've provided in the past for recreation programs. So, so in a way, I guess we're Roger's poor cousin. So we, um, <laughs> under, Anne's prodding, we were founded 40 plus years ago. Um, we are a 501c3 with a restricted beneficiary and that beneficiary is basically the civic projects in our community. And the priority is to the city of Palo Alto. Now, um, since we fund program, we started out with very small kind of horizon. We wanted to keep the Mayfate Parade in existence. We wanted to keep the Moonlight Run going. We, and so what, how do we do that? So, um, you know, at that time, 40 years ago, I mean, there was general, generally less wealth in our community than there, is now, and um, we started the black and white ball as a way of just getting extra funds so that we weren't dependent on, um, so that we weren't at risk for the amount of money that we got through an appeal, so that we would always have some source of, of funds. And for years, um, it was, you know, a very popular event for adults um, in, the, in the community. Many of us were hardworking, long-houred people, and so once a year we got to spiff it up, as it were. Um, I guess what we, our focus initially was, we did projects in the foothills. We did, as I said, the uh, moonlight run. We did funding for activities and our focus was primarily on kids in a sense that, you know, whether it was um, whatever activity would keep them active, that was our first level. As we got more and more funding, we did small projects. Um, what will I say? Um, we don't have uh, like a five-year fund because the city, we our experience over the past 40 years, uh, REC is the one place the city cuts every time there is a, um, a constriction in their funding. And so we, it, our experience has been they will always be happy to have money for Halloween on Cal Ave or whatever. So 
we generally do not look at holding money and um, we're very happy that Roger is there to raise the money for capital things because initially our efforts were all focused on ensuring that um, money that was given to us would be used in the community. I mean, that's basically what, what we do. We're a community entity that is, if you want, restricted to supporting the city of Palo Alto. And we chose that um, programs were the things that were most crucial. And they were the things that young people that grow up here and then leave and go elsewhere would you know, would benefit most from. Um, so Jack, Jack yes. is, it, is, it, is it true to say that the Recreation Foundation um, used special, a special event like the Black and White Ball to raise money, have excess after you covered the cost and were able to get sponsors for the Black and White Ball? And then what was left over essentially went to support other programs that needed funding, is that right? Yeah, but generally we restrict, I mean, there was never enough money to fund any, you know, fields and things like that. We, we, so, do you, do you, we fund do you, activities. Do you get um, money for, do you get contributions from citizens? Just, uh, I'm going to write you a check because I like the Recreation Foundation kind of thing. We used to, but the, the change in the um, well, let's say the cost of housing changes it change the kind of people that come into the community. And Roger has more contact with them than we do because many of those people are here, you know, as adults, they're not here. Um, they, they're not raising young kids that, um, for whom this is a, um, a big part, but all of the city's programs are beloved and they all need funding. And mm -hmm. so we've, we've never, um, let's say we never felt we had the space to hold money. So anytime, um, you know, Darren comes up with something that he needs or something that's going to, um, disappear if we don't help it, we help it and uh, until our, our funds run out. We tried to keep um, you know a, a minimal balance. We have um, some we have stocks and things that we hold, but they're you know compared to kind of Rogers buckets, they're they're relatively small and none of them are restricted funds so that you know, for example, if Roger got a million dollars for the new library or a new library, um, it has to go to the library if that's what the donor gave it to, um, gave it for. We generally look at year to year uh, to the city and see what is, what is their shortfall. Mm -hmm. We don't fund city staff. That's, we, we, we fund city programs. Okay, thank you. I'm wondering if the commissioners um, have any questions about the Recreation Foundation that they would like to ask you. Um, let's start with the vice chair. Sure, uh, th thank you for, for your, your service and dedication to our community and, and helping helping more things happen. Um, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I asked Roger, with what's been the most rewarding or exciting uh, contribution that the, your organization has been able to make in the last year, challenging year? Well, I, I guess, um, you know, if you're going to, you have a, a five-year-old kid who rides his bicycle down University Avenue um, in the Mayfay Parade for, what is, what is it, eight blocks or something, um, and that's your, your, the intensity of your life, that's the most important thing. So if you have a kid that wants to hike a trail in Foothills Park and you know, something gets washed away and with 
$20,000 the city doesn't have, we can correct that. That's the most exciting thing. I mean, truthfully, what we got hooked on, and I will blame Anne for this, what we got hooked on was the fact that what people, people love the building when they can use it, but it's the joy of the activity. So we're, we, you know, and we, we never had enough money to get much behind that. So when, when Roger comes along and says, you know, I'll raise money for all of the things the city has neglected in the last 40 years, um, it's fantastic. You know, it, so uh, I think for us, it's not a single project and it's not a single age group. I mean, I didn't mention the New Year's Eve senior ball because we haven't had it for a couple of years and we haven't had the black and white ball because COVID did that. But if you're a senior and you're somewhat beyond 40 and you uh, don't get out much and you go, uh, you know, the, the Saturday before New Year's, you get to go to a an event that's special for you, that's the most exciting thing. So every, thanks, thanks. Every, that's great. everything that we did was exciting for some group of, of our community. And our sadness is money got tight and the kind of donors that were available didn't quite understand program as much and and you know okay i'll stop there okay other commissioners keith yeah, so darren how does the recreation foundation fit into your funding is it stuff that is unexpected that you give them a call or is it when you get your budget and isn't what you and you know there's going to be a hole and so you call ahead of time or what's how do they fund you yeah, I think it's both. It's primarily the recreation division, so less less the operations and maintenance team that I'm in charge of and, and do with. But I think there's a mix. There's some ongoing programs that the Rec Foundation regularly funds, and then periodically Rec will reach out to the organization and Jack and ask for particular help on a particular item. Darren will say to us, uh, you know, there's a group of uh, families that want to do an, a Halloween event on um, this Halloween, four weeks away. It's not in our budget. Can you help? And we, we look at what we have left for the year and, and we look, and you know, we're, we're not gonna say no to that group of parents that it's gonna, and it has become, it's like the senior event for the age group between, I would say, Darren, I don't know, I would think between roughly four and what, nine or 12, that's a big event for them. And so then, you know, if we get word, and then sometimes we, we may have to say, we're, fully, we're out of funds this year, we can't do it till next year. And if you can't get it fund next, funded next year, um, you know, I think a lot of what we do has been COVID limited so the 4th of July event, those, those sorts of things which aren't traditionally funded by the city, but are city um, perceived activities, we fund probably some part of most of them. Okay, great. Um, David Moss, do you have any further comments? Yeah. Um... I am, uh, to answer Jack's question for him, I think the fact that we were able to have a Mayfet parade and a, and a moonlight run this year after the, uh, the terrible year, la previous year is really fantastic. And I, I really, really appreciate that we had that. And, that leads me to the question, to my question, and it's really to both, both uh, groups, um, but I'll start with Jack, and that is advertising. I noticed that they have uh, a huge ad for the Moonlight Run 
and they have an ad for the Mayfet parade, but do you ask actually ask for donations in those ads? And would you do that in the future? We didn't, yeah, would you do that in the future for other things? Uh, now that you can't do a black or haven't been able to do a black and white ball, I don't know how much was raised for Moonlight Run, but I don't think much of it went to you. That's right. So I have kept a secret. So when we get an event like the Moonlight Run and it gets popular, we talked the, the weekly into taking over that event. And so, you know, we, we knew the city would not continue to fund it in those years, but the, it was something that fit in with their perception of, you know, they're dealing with adults and they want to be community as they are, they want to be community active. And so they've taken over. We, we will happily um, divest ourselves of any event that we have confidence a uh, someone will take over and nourish. So we had events like checker clubs. Uh, we had events, chess clubs. We had events of, you know, um, adult, um, what will I call it? Limited ability adult activities um, at Coverley. We had a lot of events at Coverley that closed down because of COVID. And again, when we can find somebody that will happily adopt them, we, we, we are not adverse to letting them go because if you want to put it that way, there are a lot of orphan activities out there that need help. So how do we raise money? We have a small board of four to five people. Um, they are program focused and um, we, lost, we should have got Roger before he got um, as committed. No, <laughs> Jack, to, we need, Jack, we need, we need recreation. Well, we had to take on, we'd let him do his thing, but we'd, maybe we could get a 1% cut or something. No, <laughs> Jack, recreation and community services needs both of your foundations, yeah. both Roger and uh, Palo Alto Recreation Foundation to support this great community that we have. I want to go to Mandy and see. Wait, 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 wait. So you haven't answered my question. Advertising. Have you ever considered advertising? Well, the weekly, uh, or the weekly will take ads for activities. It will not become the, uh, if you want, the appealer for um, a specific foundation. So um, we, we do advertise, we do let the community know that this activity is supported by the Black and White Ball funds. But when you don't have your major fundraiser, it's hard to, yeah. to do it. And we have, you know, like Roger has, we are often remembered in people's wills, and we will occasionally get a an unexpected, um, yeah. but but never large enough because uh, okay. we spend. I mean, I, I really re I really admit it. You know, we spend on today because that's when kids need right. the, the, before they the, grow before they grow up. Okay, let's see if Mandy has a question, and then we can wrap this up tonight. Mandy, um, yeah, just really quickly the. Uh, there are other foundations in the Bay Area that do sort of a, a will with letter writing campaign to try and promote that that have been very successful um, um, in the recent years, especially. Uh, but my question was really sort of a broader one of this, it seems very need based. And if something comes up and you are able to address that need, uh, which is great. But prior to COVID, if we can remember that far back now, um, uh, was there any sort of conversations with the city um, or also with Roger on strategically prioritizing the funds with relation to where the need is financially, where the community interest is and really where the history and um, 
uh, of certain events like the May Fet Parade lie to sort of uh, think about where those funds could be allocated in advance or is it more responsive? Well, we, we haven't had the, the luxury Roger had. I mean, Roger can focus on a project and, um, you know, we've had other groups, you know, build uh, the, the library, you know, um, and Roger came along and done. And I, I don't wanna sort of sound like, but that wasn't our focus. It, we want, as I said, by the time um, we had raised the money for a library, it might take five years. So are you gonna not have five, um, uh, what, pick, pick an event. Are we not gonna have five um, 4th of July uh, barbecues? Are we not gonna have five moonlight, then moonlight runs or five um, foothill park uh, treks or whatever it is? And the answer would, for us would be no. I mean, we, um, we basically are, well, and, and again, you can blame Anne for it. We initially, when we started out 40 years ago, we didn't have any, any conviction that the city would ever refund many of these events. And we just didn't want to lose them. So, um, and again, the history of the city, I mean, even a wealthy city like this is when things get rough, they hit community services and uh, recreation. And so I'll, I'll say that um, we, and we're entirely, you know, we're entirely volunteers. So, I mean, we do what we can do as the group. So Mandy, um, from sitting in on some of the meetings, I, I think that it's fair to say now, um, Jack, that there are certain things that you guys fund and underwrite on a regular basis every year, like the Halloween, like the bands for May Fade and other things. And then when the city has requests for either a new program or a program that needs additional funding, um, you also step in and do that. So I think it's really good to hear from both of you and both foundations and have the commissioners ask questions so that we can really see the difference between the foundations and also the similarities, because we're really all in this together and um, we really all need to work together to make sure Palo Alto continues to be the place that we have always wanted it to be. So um, what I'd like to do now is just to thank Roger and thank Jack for coming and sharing again with us. Um, I'm certainly supportive Chair. of Chair. both. Chair. Just, let me finish, David. I'm certainly supported for both uh, to both of the foundations and I think that um, we're all looking forward to working with them in the future, especially when we move through the agenda. So now, David, go ahead. Jeff Lemaire is here. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't see him. He's not on my screen. Thank you for letting me know. And Keith, I see your hand up before we leave this topic. And you're on mute as well. Aside from that, we're good. Yeah, we'll give Jeff the first shot. Is there any questions that Jeff has? Uh, no, you know, I joined late. I just I, what I do want to do though is thank Roger and Jack for their years of selfless service, their philanthropic work, uh, just the example they've set for our community. And I really appreciate Jack's uh, take on, you know, if we don't fund something one year, that is one year that a child misses out on something. And and myself having a young child, I, I see how these moments go by, and especially in COVID where we've stopped doing certain things and you see someone's childhood fly by. And so I really appreciate the urgency with which he carries on this foundation to, to try to fund these um, activities. And I'm very much appreciative and, and I hope that there is a younger generation that can, can take up the mantle um, as, as, as we change and, and as our city changes. Uh, so again, all of my thanks and all of my appreciation. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, very well said, Jeff. Glad you're glad you're here, Keith. I, I want to say my thanks too. I think it, you do a great service. Uh, there's so much to fund, and even more so now with COVID, Darren's budget has just gotten slashed. 
so I feel kind of helpless here. We, we see funding opportunities, uh, but how can we help you? I mean, I would love to have put a lawn sign in my front yard that says, uh, uh, fund these foundations. I would love to give my postal carrier instead of some candy, give him uh, a, a card saying I gave money to the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation. What kind of, that to me, there's especially a lot of people who are getting up in age have just too much stuff and giving them an experience of saying, next time you go to the park, you know that you helped make this park better. That to me would be a wonderful thing this time of year. I really want to be able to do that. How, do, how can we get that going? Um, I'll defer to Roger because he's a master at raising monies, but I think that's what we have to do. I mean, right now, if we can't have something like the black and white ball, we don't produce the money that the programs will need. So um, I am very happy to take lessons because my focus has always been, I should have admitted that, you know, you know I was a skater when there was a, almost no skating rink here and at the end of it. I mean, that's what I focus on, but I need, we need the Rogers to somehow, I don't know if there's a way in which whenever we get a major project going, we could also have an endowment for that project, but endowments wear out. I mean, it's a continual need, raising money, for a wealthy city like Palo Alto, I mean, what do you think a, a, a city like Oakland or a, a, a 10 years ago or 20 years ago or, or you know, East Palo Alto, how do they manage to go through these things when we are struggling and we have, a, you know, we are all relatively well-to-do members and we may have all started out modestly, but we we live here. So, anyways, I'll, I'm I'm happy to take any suggestions any of you have about. I'll take the lawn signs. I, I'd like um, 400 of them, please. And um, then for cards um, on Halloween, um, we'll you know donate to your community. I mean, I, I, you know, if you can, if we had every eight year old or every 10 year old, just say, thank you for your candy. Will you also think about this? Yes. But I, I mean, that becomes, that's a little more difficult um, to get parents to buy into something they may not be as, but thank you for even that inspiration, we have to find ways in which the Rogers and the Jacks aren't, much, you know, we're not 40. Roger might be, but I'm not. And so we have to be, replace ourselves. But if we're so busy just keeping going, it doesn't work that I, if, at least in our foundation. It's hard work. Jack, uh, Jack there's a. And listening to Jack, I have this enormous big head that I just raise all these millions of dollars. Uh, I wish that were true. And I remember 30 years ago, meeting a guy at like 11 p.m. We'd been up for three days. That was Jack Morton that saved the uh, Winter Lodge. And that's when we first, uh, first met. Uh, back to your question, though. You know, as all startups, and we've all been involved in startups or, or know people that have, one of, the, one of the things we were hoping when we started Friends of the Palo Alto Park, that we could have a, uh, uh, each park would have a group of people that would take care of the park. We thought about a junior ranger program. And uh, so we, we have not been able to pull that off. But, but when you really think about it, if we could somehow get neighbors that say, this is my park. My daughter, uh, my granddaughter lives down in South Palo Alto. And the magical bridge is her park, she says. So, but so that that is one way. But it is hard to to uh, to do that generally. And the question is, we really haven't as a group. And uh, Mandy, I would be one, I'd love to visit with you because you're an expert in this field about how we might try to see the big needs and then how to do it. But what we found that uh, that people. Uh, uh, like the Magical Bridge, it took us a long time to get that going. But then we hit a place where 
we had some people in the community that wrote some six figures checks and uh, and these not just Dick Perry doing it so uh, so there is money uh, we haven't cracked crack the thing and I don't want anyone to think that it's magical and while we have raised money uh, we haven't raised jillions of dollars and uh, Jack you're too you're too and that's that's all I had well, Roger, thank, thank you very much for that. I, I certainly appreciate that. We have a couple more hands up. And Darren, you've been having that hand up for a long time. So let's go to you. Oh, thank you, Chair. I, on behalf of staff, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank both Jack and Roger. Uh, so many times throughout my time with the city, they've called and said, hey, is there anything you need? How can we help? Or, you know, they're just always so supportive. They really walk the talk and do so much for us. I just wanted to thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Well said. Um, David? Yeah, and this was the whole reason I brought up the point about advertising. Uh, Roger has this core group of, of uh, uh, in his network, and you can't do everything with a few very wealthy people. You have to branch out and get the younger generation. You have to get people who are going to per, per um, primarily benefit from these, um, the Mayfet parade and, and movie nights and chili cook-offs and Halloween and music in the parks. Um, all of these things, people will be, would love to be able to donate. Um, and what's nice about the Moonlight Run is that there's an entrance fee. And even above and beyond the entrance fee, you can make a small donation. And I would like to see, especially on, on Jack's side, I would like to see almost every event advertised with a blurb at the bottom that says, if you'd like to make a donation, uh, uh, here's where you do it. That way you expand the network and it's not just friends of Roger. It's, it's a much bigger community and people are gonna benefit from these events. Uh, um, so, and I see PIE, the, uh, the, Palo Alto, uh, the one for the schools, similarly, they advertised uh, heavily at all of these schools and uh, that's how they get their funding. So that, that's the only comment I wanted to make. Okay, well, I am going to exercise what I'm hopeful is a chair's prerogative, and I am going to close this discussion and move on to the next discussion, which we're just going to slide into because it's all about fundraising. Um, and I want to say that I'm delighted that we have spent so much time on this. I'm delighted that Roger and Jack could join us, and I certainly salute them and their groups for what they've done um, for our community, and I know all the other commissioners kind of echo everything that's been said. So Jack and Roger, you are welcome to stay with us, um, but you're also welcome to excuse yourself, whichever you wanna do. And for sure we will be in touch with you. So um, if that's okay with everybody, we're gonna go on to the next item on the agenda. Can I say thank you to all you, what all you do, because we wouldn't have a focus uh, in the community if you weren't there. And I am gonna go home and, um, try to finish a few things that I haven't done because it seems that I'm always trying to finish a few things. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Roger, as well. Um, so the next thing on our agenda is the um, potential fundraising opportunities for parks and recreation programs and projects. And this is really a discussion that I have, have pushed to have based on um, our ad hoc and what we've been considering. And I wanted to provide a little bit of background. I think it's great we had such a long discussion with Jack and Roger and lots of good questions and lots of thoughts, which I hope are captured um, in the minutes. So um, the ad hoc, the first, what I'm calling ad hoc number one uh, met uh, at least two years ago. We had a lot of great ideas and we put together some reports and made some reports to um, the commission and um, then COVID happened. And so I wanted to make sure we didn't lose sight of those ideas and suggestions collected from the ad hoc. 
And so we're calling that one um, ad hoc number one. And, and we really did years of work on, on that. Um, and what I'd like to do right now is to ask um, Vice Chair to speak a little bit about the work that was done on the first ad hoc, and then David can follow and I'll throw in a few things. Um, I did have the memo um, that we put together from the first ad hoc and included in the minute, uh, not in the minutes, in the agenda so that, so that you could read it. So I'd like to um, just hear the ad hoc talk about the first, our first um, report. And then I'd like to go to ad hoc number two this, this year. Um, and call on Jeff Lemaire and Mandy Brown and to talk about the current situation with fundraising and ideas. And I think we all have to look at this, and I'm gonna say this again when we get to the gym update, as the city has a budget crisis, there's little money, as we've all talked about, and there's probably less staff to do the work that needs to be done for all our great ideas. And so um, keep that in mind as we're talking through this. I'd like to spend about 30 minutes on this. It's about um, 8.25 right now. So if we finish this discussion up at nine, we will have another um, 30 minutes or 45 to talk about um, specifics about the new gym. So if that's okay with everybody, that's my suggestion um, for right now. And um, all of this will be reflected in the minutes that both ad hocs, I think, have done some, some really good work. So let's start with the vice chair on ad hoc number one. Jeff? Sure, uh, th th thank you. And, and I think the uh, attachment A, which you've included, which is from our September 22nd, 2020 uh, PRC meeting is, 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 is a good, good summary. And we were in, in the midst of, co of COVID. And so our focus was how do we address immediate funding and resource gaps? Um, and then in the bigger picture, how do we explore opportunities for, for lar larger projects, well, like a gym, for example? Yes. Uh, and so we kind of came up with three, three approaches for the immediate uh, funding and resource gaps, uh, figure out how to <clears throat> up, update it the, uh, and, and promote a, a comprehensive comprehensive summary of, of donor and volunteer opportunities for community members, uh, because it, it really wasn't, uh, the, the, the details are, were, were hard for us to figure out. And so we felt like if it's that, if, if we're, we're focused on this and it's that difficult for us to uncover, uh, this is, there's really a need for us to clarify this. And that really is, is clarifying and publicizing uh, how how community members can contribute, and it's 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 sort of like a, a writing a, a playbook because there's there's so many different uh, opportunities, but each kind of a funding opportunity is a little bit different, and and so we were really looking to try to document things, and 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 then another idea was to highlight uh, unique uh, opportunities, and and then in terms of the the bigger picture. Uh, or the longer term, uh, uh, larger projects, you know, look into what is it, what are the funding mechanisms for this? Can we uh, apply for some special grants? Uh, obviously working with the, the local foundations that we've just heard from who do such a great job in, with specific focuses. Uh, so it's got, this is the overall focus of our group was uh, let, let's, Put, put things together for, so people can understand it. Let's document it. And so the things are in, in place so, so we understand where we are moving forward. Uh, one of the obstacles we ran into was the city website was in the process of getting updated. Yeah. And so a lot of the work we were trying to do got put on hold and it's probably time to, uh, to revisit that now. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, David? Yeah, that was a good summary. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, paint the bigger picture that we have been working on this for a long time. Yep. And I remember uh, being in a meeting with Anne and Jeff Lemaire with the, uh, with the uh, people who were um, spearheading the Junior Museum fundraising and how difficult it is 
Uh, no, it wasn't the Junior Museum. It was the, the library. library, the Palo Alto okay. Library, the Mitchell Park Library. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was the Palo Alto Main Library. Anyway, it's a it's a daunting, daunting task, and I am so uh, excited to see all of the ideas that are going to be presented in the in in the uh, the second ad hoc uh, that they did a very good job of taking what we started and and moving it light years ahead. So um, I'm, it's something that we absolutely have to deal with. We've known we've had to deal with this for many years, and I think we're now on the cusp of be actually being able to do something about it. So that's all I want to say. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I would just add there were a, th a few things out of the report that I wanted to highlight. One is the importance of trying to figure out how to fund a grant writer so that we could pursue some of the grants that I believe are available um, from both um, government and private foundations. Um, I also want to make sure, again, that we're aware of the situation with the budget and also of the resources of the, the city staff as we request and start to publicize the need um, and the opportunity for contributions. And then the last two things to say are, you know, we have this wonderful master plan and it has a lot of great and outstanding ideas and it, which all are going to take time and money. And um, it's really great to have it as kind of a, um, a, um, a structure um, and a, a foundation for what we're thinking about. And then the last thing in view of the last couple of years and what we've all found out about our communities and, and each other and COVID, um, I think as we're looking at fundraising, we have to be mindful of equity and fairness um, including the whole community in the opportunities that exist. So those are the points that I wanted to add to this particular ad hoc one discussion. Um, do any of the other commissioners have any comments um, for the ad hoc at this point? And it's okay to say no? Uh, Lamb, I should have asked you, do any members of the public wish to speak? We have zero requests to speak. Great, okay. Um, so let's go to ad hoc number two, um, and Mandy, would you like to start off? And I want to commend Mandy for um, some really great points that she made in our meetings about uh, focus and about prioritizing. So Mandy, go ahead. Thanks. Well, it all started because I'm very sensitive to the staff, the staffing <laughs> responsibilities and um, and I'm familiar, obviously, with the restrictions of, of the roles and, and time constraints. Um, that being said, I think there are opportunities and there are a lot of strengths that I see that we can take advantage of in terms of just making people more aware of these opportunities um, and promoting um, organizations um, like the Friends of the Palo Alto Parks or like the Parks uh, Foundation. Um, and so some of the uh, ideas that I had mentioned are on page five of our report, um, sort of taking a page from how libraries have done funding in the past with the Adopt-A-Park program. Um, a lot of library branches have specific budgets for each branch, not necessarily in every city, but sometimes, um, and the Friends of or um, local community will fund through donations. Um, I've looked at a variety of budgets and some of the library budgets were 90% funded by friends and then the rest funded by um, the local agency just because there was so much support. Um, and so that, that sort of feeling of, oh, that's my park, we could take advantage of by providing that opportunity clearly on the website, uh, hopefully with minimal staff time impact. Um, another thing is, is just having that sort of simple landing page of opportunities to donate on the city website and easy for a grassroots campaign for people to share that information. Um, and then I believe we discussed at our meeting uh, about uh, a giving day. So having a single day or a week um, to really promote it rather than trying to constantly do it day in, day out um, and really bombarding people with the information, but really doing a more targeted approach. Um, but thanks to everybody, great, great idea. And we couldn't have done any of this uh, without the legwork that was already done with the great foundation. So thanks to ad hoc number one as well. Thank you very much. Jeff LaMere. Yeah, so I'd also like to thank 
ad hoc number one for, for the work that they did to get this started. And also Mandy, who put a lot of thought into this and, and you know, really brought up about trying to simplify things. And, and I think that's very, very important. And then lastly, I'd really like to credit the chair for uh, pushing this idea and pushing these projects. Uh, and that's with all of these all of these things that we do, they need champions. And I think that with the projects that we look at, if we could find champions and stakeholders, that's that's what really makes these projects go is when there's a there's passionate people behind them. And I think what what I hope that this document can do is perhaps provide something of a roadmap for people, because I think sometimes people are a bit lost. They may have an idea, but they don't know how to get it to council or how to get it before the commission. Um, and they don't know how to raise money or what money is available to be raised. And I think that if, if there's ways we can even summarize this further and simplify it, but something that uh, an average person who has an idea or, or a want, or you know, even somebody like the people from the skate park who are really pushing the skate park and, and, and they're passionate about it, but finding those stakeholders is, is so important. And being able to give them something or some sort of summary, hey, here, here might be a roadmap of what you could do to, to help raise some funds, or here's what might need to be done to, to get a project like this off the ground. And I think all of those things are very important. And I really compliment everybody for putting in the time to come up with all these different ideas that we have. And, and I'd like to uh, pass this on to the chair who, who has put so much work into this to uh, further discuss. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I really appreciated and, and enjoyed the time that we spent working through a ad hoc one and ad hoc two. And I thought that everybody had such great ideas. I mean, remember back when we did the original report and Keith said, I wanna have lawn, lawn signs. And I'm like, wow, that's a great idea. And they're probably not that expensive if all the political people can afford to have them. So there should be some easy things that we could pull out of this. And we're all um, smart people. And I think that we can um, go back in terms of our ad hoc right now, we're not quite finished with it and further summarize some really really simple things that don't cost any money and Darren cost very little staff time, things that we already have that we can pull together. Um, I like the one stop shop portal on the website and I'd like to work on that to make sure that fundraising opportunities are all in the same place. I also think that we have a lot of great partner organizations and stakeholders that we can continue to, to talk to about what we need um, to do in the future. And um, we kind of ran into a, a stone wall because the website was being changed. And I think the ad hoc probably needs to go back and look and see what we really want. Um, Darren, is that a possibility that we can, we can make some suggestions for a fund development or a fundraising page with everything kind of on one page? Do you think? Maybe. Yes, Chair, we can. Okay. Um, so so that, that would be good. I think it's good that the ad hoc, excuse me, that the CIP uh, group is going to meet um, next month or next week. And so we can see some gaps and that kind of thing. But I think the real key is communication, creating a vision, and really continuing to be in um, conversation with people who want to help and want to make this city continue to be the city that we've loved for so long. I mean, I was thinking about all those projects that Jack mentioned with the Mayfay Parade and the Chili Cook-Off and we can go on and on and on and on. Um, and that's why we live here uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, the other thing I'd like to add is, and I, I would hope that somehow we can work with the field committee, Darren. I don't, here's the thing with the Brown Commission, I don't exactly know how to do this, but I think that there's an opportunity to do some good work for the fields right now um, with some fundraising, but we have to be able to talk together. So I'm gonna look to you for guidance about how we can do that, uh, working with the stakeholder groups. And then I think once we have some, what we call wins, um, that we can make some really um, exciting things happen. Um, I'd like to go to Councilmember Ku and see if she has any comments 
Um, I apologize. I skipped over you, Council Member Ku. Um, oh, no, our last, our no, no. Round, so. So. Not at all. It, it, it's very exciting to hear you being so excited. So um, yeah, keep 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 on uh, speaking. Well, we said I'm learning this, a lot. We said that this was the fun commission to be on, but I really think that we can do some really really good things. So let's see. Um, any specific comments about things that were in the report that commissioners would really like to see done right away? Whether Keith, you could talk about your lawn signs if you want to. No, I'm looking through the report. That it is looks really good. You guys have done a lot of really good work here. A lot of good thinking has gone into this. Um, I mean, I I think this the city needs to take an aggressive action in the sense that Darren gets a lot of funding through it, and I think we should try to encourage that. And so, for example, the Enjoy catalog. When you register for a class, it would be nice if a, if one of the fields was uh, optional donation or tax deductible donation to Friends of Palo Parks. And if you're registering for a hundred dollar class, you can register, throw five dollars extra in. Yep. Um, maybe inline ads on the Palo Alto website, just because that's our assets. Our assets are we're, we're forcing people to look at the website. Can we take advantage of that? Uh, can you put up signs when they're captive audience by bleachers or on the fences by on the baseball fields? Uh, when you're sitting there for two hours watching a baseball game and there's a sign in front of you that says give to the Pelto, uh, <laughs> Friends of Pelto Parks, it will sink in. So I, I think we have to look at where uh, we as a city have people that are captive audiences and, and try and target them then. Yeah, that's very good. That needs to go on our list. I don't think we specifically captured that. Mandy, any other uh, further comments from you? This is sort of on the boring side of things, but if like looking at the process notes from the ad hoc one, I think maybe representing that graphically or sort of um, working that out uh, for things like a new request and maybe how it relates to an ad hoc might be an mm -hmm. interesting exercise and so that mm -hmm. we could visually look at it and then when somebody comes to that opportunity does arise we do have something to share with their, them or to show them that hey this process is, is not that scary and um, it, it can yeah, be think, done and I this think is that's a really a really good idea um and david does there was a lot of credit for um writing all that out and like step one and step two and step three and it'd be great to have it um visually um so we got a we got stuck a little bit on that because covid came and covid was more important but um, um good good to mention that i also would say that mandy has suggested in the um, report and hopefully we'll all get to take a look um, some really good websites, other cities who have done really good, um, good things on ideas in terms of parks and all of that. Um, and so worth it to look and see what um, our colleagues in other places have done. Um, I'd like to, if the commissioner commission agrees, and if we can do this for the whole commission, maybe we can't, Darren, because maybe this is a Brown Act thing. Um, I'd like to invite the city of San Francisco uh, Parks Alliance people um, to give us a presentation either at a commission meeting about the Parks Alliance and what they've done in San Francisco or maybe at an ad hoc. And I'd look to the staff to see what your suggestion is, what might be better, uh, better to just do it in an ad hoc situation and then share with the commission or do it at a commission meeting. I don't know. So maybe we can think about that. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm glad to, to check in. Just my initial reaction is I don't see a problem with them coming to share with the full commission, but I'm glad to check into that. Okay, that'd be great, um, because I think that they provide a, will provide a lot of useful models of some really big projects that they've gotten done um, over the past 10 to 20 years, and also some really good reactions to COVID um, and programming for that kind of thing as well. Not that our staff doesn't do great things at all, that because you all do so. Um, but I always feel like we can learn from other people and other groups what they've done. So um, let's see, David. You have Excuse me, Chair, Chair I, I'd just like to comment that I, I think uh, I, I agree with the, what Darren has said that I think that would be a good presentation to have for the full commission. I think the ad hoc group role is really to, to work on things and then bring it back to the, the full commission to review. Um, and 
a meeting with the SF Park Alliance and and and, and learning from them uh, as a as a body, I think would really be uh, help, helpful as, as well as appropriate. Good. And so, Darren, I'll wait to hear from you what you what what we can do within the scope of the Brown Commission. And um, but good, I, I I would prefer to do it in a full meeting. So, okay, David. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. The sure. comment is uh, going back to what uh, Jeff Lemaire said about champions and stakeholders. Uh, I so firmly believe in that and uh, identifying those, those stakeholders uh, is so important for each and every CIP and each and every one of these uh, projects that uh, Jack Morton is trying to um, raise funds for, I think is, is so important. And my, um, and I also want to uh, highlight what uh, Keith said about uh, a sign at the entrance to each park and in front of uh, each um, uh, field that says, uh, you know, we, we're always doing projects for this particular park, like my Cubberly track. Uh, if there was a, a, a sign that said, uh, if you want to contribute to uh, the upkeep of the Coverly track or or the restrooms, but I don't even think I don't even think we need to mention the restroom. I think if we said that that uh, there are a number of projects that are going to affect this park, and if you want to help contribute to that, here's here's the place where you can go to do that, and whether or not. You have enough money to do the restroom at Coverly Field yet or not is sort of besides the point. Um, you may have the money, you may not, but if we can get people to realize that we're always making improvements in that park uh, and, and they can contribute, I think that's uh, really um, an easy thing to do to put up those those uh, signs at the entrance. However, then, David, if you let's say we put up the sign tomorrow mm -hmm. and we would need to have a place for the money to go and right. we would have to have approval for that money to go someplace from the council right darren or no 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 i think it depends a little bit chair on what we're fundraising so like we talked about if it's skate park we first we need approval from council and you need a repository like the friends uh, of palto parks but i'm thinking back to what roger said is I have a fund, I can set up a fund for each and every park. People can donate to that fund. And then the question is when it finally gets to city council and they decide that they're going to put a restroom at Coverly Field, then you could draw money from that fund. Do you need city council permission to draw money from Rogers fund to offset some of the cost of the restroom. No, we don't. That's key. So and they don't even have to know. But yeah, anyway, go ahead. So we could go to Roger then. I just wanna make sure that I'm clear about this. Um, sorry to belabor it, but we could go to Roger and have him do a bucket on his website for each one of the parks and people yes. could put money in there and we don't need approval from the council. That's that right. Correct? Yeah, it's uh, so long as it's not tied to some expectation for a large city project that the city is gonna now be holding to maintain, upkeep, it's, fund, maintain. that kind of thing. Okay, I got it, I got right. it. Uh, that's good, so we should do that tomorrow. Yes, <laughs> and so then this, that leads to the second, my, my question to Darren, and that is explain to me about grant writers. Is a grant writer staff or is a grant writer a consultant? Um, can, can we fund uh, a grant writer without city council approval or city manager approval? How does that work? It has worked both ways. We've had city staff and many city staff, myself included, have written and gotten grants of varying sizes. If you're um, not busy. 
If, yeah, and that's typically the issue that there's just not enough staff capacity to do that. Certainly in my division, we have far too little staff to be submitting and getting those grants. And then it's not only getting it, it's the management of that grant, which can extend out for years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an important element to be thinking of. It's, um, it's not totally free. There's a burden that comes with that, that generous gift of cash. So yes, staff can do it. And you can hire a grant writer to, to chase specific uh, grant funding. For example, if and when we get approval from council to do some improvements to the Buckeye Creek that we had talked about so long ago, that's one that's definitely got potential for grants and maybe part of the CIP funding would be a certain amount to bring on a consultant grant writer who would pursue those grants and get them for the city. Uh, that's, that's feasible too. However, and this is an important caveat, is we do get council approval. Um, sometimes it's city manager, depending on the threshold of the amount of money, but council approval before pursuing grants. Uh, so you could write a grant, but you can't pursue it. No, no, no. The, the, the writing the grant is, is pursuing it. Uh, oh. Yeah. So in certain situations, we would need council approval before pursuing a grant. And, like, and, I, and I can get more details on that. I don't have it handy. Yeah, but like Buckeye Creek? Yes, that, that's one that we would not, A, the, the project itself hasn't even been reviewed by council and approved, let alone uh, the ability to pursue funding for it. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. Any other commissioner questions? Um, I don't see any. I don't see any hands up. And my goal was to finish this item by nine o'clock so we could move on to the next item, which is sort of the same subject. Um, I, can I ask Council Member Ku if you have any further comments or questions? No, no. Please carry on. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'd like to comment real quickly, sure. If you don't mind. I just no, want to I say that. Oh. Just want to say I, I appreciate the the great work uh, that this ad hoc's put together in in pr preparing the report and materials and uh, you know furthering the effort. Uh, I, I really I really really like Jeff's comments about champions and that that really resonates strongly with me. Um, Mandy's fingerprints are all over the materials with her detailed external research and uh, associated links. Uh, that, that's great work and very helpful. And, and Anne's consistent passion for driving this subject, uh, trying to find ways to channel private resources for the benefit of our community, uh, and consistently pushing that is it, it, great. So I, I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you for all of that. It's, uh, uh, it's We have a great team, all of us to work with and great staff to work with as well. So it makes it a very enjoyable um, experience. I know that we all wish it would go a little bit faster, but that's just that that's just the world that we live in right now. So um, I'm very excited now to move on to the next um, piece of the agenda, which I now have gotten lost in my papers here. Um, and that is a discussion on potential opportunities for the parks and recreation, uh, no, the vision for the new Palo Alto gym. And this is um, an item that um, I've been excited about for a very long time. Um, and I um, included um, a, a memo and a discussion. And I wanna say again, that we know that there is very little budget and we know that, actually we know that there's no budget and we know that there's very little staff in terms of resources. The ad hoc tried to work on this with that realization. And I think that we can even have Darren say that we didn't spend too much of staff time on creating this. Um, this group has been um, discussing a gym. We actually started back, um, not the ad hoc, but started back with the master plan that calls out uh, the need for a gym for a lot of reasons um, back in 2016, 2017. And um, so we've met for the last year on a pretty on a monthly regular basis to talk about three things that we decided that we needed to know. One is the location in Palo Alto of a gym, if we were able to do one. And two, the what a gym needs, uh, what kinds of things do you put in a gym that 
that are really important? And three, what was the scope of it? Is there, is there an appetite in the community um, to raise the money for a privately funded gym? And when I say that, I wanna uh, be definite about two different um, kinds of money to be raised. Um, one, the capital costs of, of funding a gym, and the second one, the operating costs of ongoing expenses for a gym um, that would go on into the future. So what I wanna do tonight is to talk a little bit more and have the ad hoc um, explain sort of their thoughts um, and uh, where we wanna go. I also would like to, um, at some point, um, get the uh, full-on support of um, all of the, me the members of the commission that we all think a gym is a good idea, that it's not just the ad hoc and recreational opportunities. And when we, when we look for that support, we also have to think about prioritizing the capital projects that we put in our work plan um, that council accepted. One was a city gym, one was what to do with the 10.5 acres, the other one was the partnership with the first T. And the final one was not forgetting about the skate park, which um, the council directed us to look at and get back to them. And the fifth is um, a, a, a discussion about the fields. But tonight I just wanna talk about the gym. And so um, I'd like to ask Jeff Lemaire um, to comment. And then I'd like to ask um, Keith to comment. Um, as well. So Jeff, you wanna go first? Sure, uh, Chair, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate your, uh, again, wanting to do this project or wanting to research this project and continuing to, to push. And when we speak about champions, it, it, it takes shape in all forms, whether it's the citizens or whether it's people on a commission who have a, an idea and, um, to me, I see uh, a city gym as something that is sorely lacking from a city of our stature and a city of our wealth. I think a gym can be an anchor of health and wellness for our community. And I think it's something that should be a priority uh, for us. Sometimes I feel we get stuck a little bit in a dream of Cumberly and that we've been able to push off some uh, ideas of a community center and a gym and a place of gathering like this because there's Coverly and Coverly is going to get renovated and built and something's going to get done. And since 1991, it's not been done. And it's an area that's of disrepair and we only own, I think, eight acres of it. So, uh, you know, I think the idea that something's going to come around soon with Coverly, it's just, it's, it's not happening. Um, and we've put some time in to think about different locations and we've put time in to think about how a gym could be used. And a gym can be used by every member of our population. There will be, you know, a gym can have areas of accessibility. A gym can have things for seniors, things for toddlers. Um, a gym meets the needs of every uh, citizen of our, of our community. And for me, a lot of it comes down to priorities. You know, our, our city and, and, and our citizens, we, we make decisions and we vote on things and we think about things and we, we make priorities. And, and that can be $40 million spent on a, a, a parking structure, which is important for businesses and important for traffic and flow, or it's $18 million on, on a bike bridge. And so there's big capital projects that have been done and those are important for our community. Uh, without any question, and, and, and the bike bridge got some grants, I understand. But my point is that when, when something is made important, something is a priority, uh, funding can be found or, or things happen. And for me, for us not to have a gym and need to rely always on, on what's available at a school or what is the state of, of Coverly is, is not acceptable. And so I'm very excited to work on this project and try to push it forward and try to come up with ideas and solutions that can be found um, to try to uh, help this project along. Thank you, Jeff. Keith? And so one of the things we looked at is what locations would be good. And there are a lot of different competing factors when we talk about the locations. Uh, one is 
uh, does the neighborhood have existing facilities uh, or not? For example, Ventura has very little facilities over there. And so this would be really a center point of the neighborhood. Whereas if you put it at Mitchell Park, which already has the nearby community center, it wouldn't have quite as much impact. Uh, but on the other hand, having it nearby schools, so during the day when the community would not be using it nearly as much, the schools could use it, that would be a, a really wonderful. And so in the next sense, Mitchell Park is very good because there's school, three schools nearby. And if you had three courts during rainy days, they would have a much more access to activities than they would without the gym. Um, and another is uh, accessibility by youth. We really want the kids to be able to bike to these locations. Uh, 10.5 acres has a lot of land down there, but that's really not very accessible for people on bicycles. And so again, something like Mitchell Park or Greer might be a better location if we are talking about accessibility by bike. Uh, and then the final one is nearby neighbors. Um, I mean, one of the nice things about uh, Ventura is that there aren't a lot of competing facilities there, but there are also neighbors right next door. And we'd have to do some outreach and say, do these neighbors, are they gonna embrace this? Or are they gonna view this as just bring more traffic into this situation? So uh, we'd, outreach would be really crucial. And so if, if neighbors are a problem, then someplace like Greer or Mitchell Park, where you could put it in towards the center of the park, that would be a, a better use. So um, we haven't found any perfect sites. There's, there's just trade-offs and what trade-offs we need to make is you know, gonna be some uh, head scratching down the road. So we haven't found any perfect sites. Um, we had a lot that we looked at over, over the last year and they are listed in the report. If anybody has any questions about them, we're happy you know, to answer them. And there may be a site someplace in Palo Alto that's not gonna be uh, used for office buildings that can be used for a gym um, that we just don't know about that maybe the property manager in retail uh, in, in real estate in the city knows or something like that. So, um, but, but one of the things that we really need to focus on is location. So in this report, we're recommending, um, at least I'm thinking we're recommending, uh, after we talked to the full commission about it, two different places. One, to focus on the 10.5 acres with the idea that we would look at all the people over there who are stakeholders, including baseball and softball, and see if we could utilize 22 acres, the, the Baylands Athletic Center and the 10.5 acres, which would give us 21 or 22 acres to redo a whole athletic complex. So that's, that's one. The second one is to really look at Ventura again and see if we can figure out a way to get some additional land to put a about a 1.7 acre gym and parking um, in that area. So those are the two recommendations, but we're also interested in what happens at Greer. We're interested in what happens at Mitchell Park. Um, we are probably the least interested and we have to talk about Coverly. I think Jeff's expressed it really well, but we've been all been waiting for a long time uh, for Coverly and we understand the reasons why we've had to wait and why it hasn't worked out, but it's just too risky right now. We need to start a gym on a place that we can be pretty confident about, about the land. So that is the discussion about the land. And I'd love to have any commissioners, um, if you have a secret place in Palo Alto that you know about where, where there's land to put a gym on, um, let's speak up now and get it on the list. So uh, David, thoughts? Wow. <laughs> I know, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, certainly Ventura gets my, my main vote, but I want to know um, when uh, would it really be that much faster than um, putting a bond measure on the ballot? Because a bond measure is, uh, this would be for Coverly and, and other things. When we did a bond measure for, this, for uh, Palo Alto schools, we got uh, two swimming pools and two gyms and a, uh, and a theater from one bond measure in one fell swoop. And I know that times are tough, but we're coming out of it. And uh, I don't think we should take that off the table. Okay. I think, 
I, I would agree. I don't think, I, I think at least it should be, it should be looked at. And, and what we're trying to do right now is to have a, uh, first of all, a commission discussion to see if we all are in favor of this or if it's just what the ad hoc thinks that we should do. I want the whole commission to be in favor of this. So that's the first thing that we want to accomplish tonight. And the second thing is to ask for Lydia's advice about um, the, the way to proceed in terms of process. Um, to to get this to council to let us do or what they ask us to do with the skate park to to pursue this further and um, there's a motion that we put together that we'll have a little bit later but where I was still wanted to talk about about location and get people's ideas for location and then we'll go on to what a gym needs and then we'll go on to the possibility of uh, private fundraising versus bond measure and that kind of thing so okay Mandy thoughts well, my first questions were on that process. And if there was a little bit more background on the conversations with the city manager to date, and if this sort of the process of bringing it forward from the ad hoc to the full commission, and then it seems like it wants to be a recommendation to the council for inclusion in the CIP or in the future no. or, or Okay. No, it was meant to be, I, I know we, we stated a number based on some of the research that we've done of $25 million, but the assumption is that this is a, a public, a private partnership um, so that the city would have to have a piece of this with staff and stuff like that to go through the process. But um, this is an assumption that we can raise the money um, and and the model that we're using is the agreement that the junior museum had for the city with some modifications about what they learned, both the city and the JMZ going through the process of that agreement, because there's some things that they would do differently, both the city and, and Are you frozen or am I? For a second, you were frozen, Chair. Was I? Figures. Um, so Mandy, does that make sense? Yes, that does. Um, well, in that case, then I do have a, a couple other questions um, just on uh, the project costs because the examples that the survey that was done of these gyms are all mostly privately funded gyms. And if there was any research done into gyms with public bidding requirements and what the Delta would be between this estimate and if it was publicly bid, um, and on that same sort of note, the the ten point five acres. If there was any any sort of additional cost given the soil conditions, um, if, if based on um, any information that we do have, um, and then I, I liked the Burgess Gym example, and I think that if we could get information from them, because um, it's all publicly available, um, sort of to create a case study information yeah. on revenue and staffing and um, just sort of the accounting for for what that facility I think that would be very helpful um, as the discussions unfold um, those are my initial thoughts just listening to it but th there's a lot of great work um, and uh, 1991 coverly like, I was just a little baby so that was that is a long time <laughs> if you would have to say that right? that was master plan number one then there was master plan number two in community uh, committees and then there was the most recent thing so yeah it was uh, it was a while ago so you could see why I'm excited about the opportunity to at least have a conversation about this in in Palo Alto and the two things that you have questions about are, I'm sure can go on the staff list I have a really great list that Darren provided um, that I included that we included in our report about things that staff suggest that um, the, that we should pursue but before we go out and do this I I felt like it was important for the whole commission to say that they either agree with caveats or they don't agree and don't want to get involved and don't want to put our name on it. And then we find a way to take it to council and ask for approvals of uh, pursuing getting information for the project. Jeff and Keith, are you, you're, that's, I'm saying this right, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, Council Member Ku, any advice for us about uh, next steps? Did you say you were going to be submitting a motion? Uh, going to do a motion in order to do what? 
Well, when we get to the motion, we'll we'll put that up in, in order to ask the, to suggest to the council what we're doing, what we've uncovered so far, and then uh, asking for your support. Um, Darren, is that the way that um, that you advised or guided? Um, well, the commission can always make a recommendation to council and right. um, the feedback I provided to the chair and to the ad hoc was a very long list of things that council would need to know if we were making this recommendation, long term costs, financial plan. Um, it was exhaustive amount of background details that council would need. And so I think chair has taken that into consideration is trying to find a way to to help get that information, but ultimately would like to bring it to council, which I think is the commission's prerogative. Absolutely. So um, that would be the way I think Darren has provided you the uh, path. Okay, thank you. So let's now um, talk a little bit about um, what we all think a, a gym needs. And I think it's important to- Excuse, excuse me, to Chair, could I have an opportunity to comment, please? Yes, I thought I asked you first. I was just, no, I am. No, no, that was, that was another item. Go, I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Thank no you problem. for raising your hand. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think the ad hoc's done some, some great research and analysis here. And uh, so thank you for putting this together and, and sharing this. Uh, it's very exciting to discuss and envision. Uh, this, this is a, it, it is, this is called out in, in the master plan, but this is a, a major project, uh, a major undertaking, and I think understanding where the priority of, of this fits in is very important. I, I, I think it's important to take a step back and specifically talk about the need for the gym, because I don't think that's really been clarified. I, we know that the city doesn't own a gym, but you, can you better quantify the need for this based on current usage and demand. And I do appreciate that Commissioner Lemaire's comments about the, a, a gym serving as an anchor or a, a hub for the, for the community for both health and wellness and, and general gathering point. So Jeff, what information are you looking for in terms of a need for a gym that the city can control? So where are we at right now in terms of gyms and usage of with youth groups and adult groups uh, for the gyms that are at Coverly, for the uh, the private gyms, for the gyms at the at the YMCA, et cetera. What what is the have have we assessed the overall demand uh, for gym space uh, for our community? And 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 one of the one of the things that isn't included here, and it's an important next step, and and it's it's appropriate to go out and ask. Uh, for council's commission or permission to pursue this first, uh, but we haven't we, we haven't <clears throat> done the community outreach, and that, that's an important step. Uh, and, and we need staff. I mean, we, and, we, I'm, and, and I'm not I'm not suggesting we should have done that done done this uh, uh, because we need staff's assistance with this, and we need permit uh, permission and go ahead from city council before we pursue that. But my my question is where we are. Uh, we, we have, a, I think there's a, a general feel that we need a gym, but has this been quantified? Well, here's some things that we do know. We do know that we do not any longer have any access to Stanford facilities, i.e. gyms. We do know that both Pally and Gunn um, are not available to the community. And I would ask uh, Commissioner LaMere to validate that, but that's my understanding. Uh, they're available at times to the community through a rental, but uh, most oftentimes that would be on a Sunday and that is it. Any weekdays are very difficult. Sometimes the junior highs are available after 7 or 8 p.m., but at the high schools, normally the only day gyms are available are Sundays. So, and I would only add to that is that in the past, and I know we're in the past, um, the... Uh, we were unable to open um, city to have access to school district gym, gyms until 12 o'clock at night, for instance, to do midnight basketball, to keep kids off the streets and stuff like that. So um, the, the access to high school gyms, um, I believe is very, very limited. Um, I think 
uh, in talking to Adam, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that um, it's sometimes hard if you're not in an established group, uh, group to rent a facility in Palo Alto. Um, and I don't know that Cubberly is the most attractive place for kids. Um, and so I think that anecdotally, we could definitely say that we, we should have a gym in Palo Alto that's city owned, um, either city operated or privately operated. That's another question. So there are lots of questions to, to sure. contemplate here. Thanks, and I, I was just gonna say, it, it, I, it's, it's clear that anecdotally uh, we, we do have a need, but I think city council may be uh, interested in, in more specific quantitative data about the, about gyms, reservations uh, for youth basketball leagues. Uh, and, 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 and Jeff, you've probably got some, some idea of this. I, I mean, I, I remember when my daughter was playing uh, YMCA basketball, sometimes we had to go to Foothill College to get gym space to play. So I, I, I believe there, the, the need is there. I believe the demand is there. I believe that the shortage is there. Uh, what programs does this, this the city staff currently uh, manage uh, in, in terms of allocating the, the, the spaces for the, for the gyms that we're uh, contracting with at, at, at Coverly? What information do we have about other organizations, basketball, volleyball, uh, in, indoor soccer, what, what, whatever it may be. Uh, well, I think, so here's, here's my response to that. I think we can find out at, that information pretty easily, but I think asking a lot of questions before um, the city council knows that we're gonna embark on that is probably not, not the best way to go. So it, I, that, again, the chicken and the egg. I do have one question. Darren, doesn't Adam control the uh, junior high gyms after hours? No, no, that's not part of the uh, brokering agreement. It's the fields and the tennis. Okay. Fields. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's a good comment about the need for um, a, a gym and quantified and all of that. Um, let's look at if you Sorry, and, and just just my, my, my other comments, which, I, which I've already touched on is that the community outreach is a, is a key next step. And, and the other thing I'd add is staff uh, input and 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 re time resources to to, uh, to to assess this in terms of what long term support uh, implications would be for for a gym. I, I think we're talking about fun getting outside funding to construct the gym, but what about the uh, ongoing maintenance, both the, the staff and financial resources? Yeah, so in addition, the ad hoc is, is getting information from outside sources about the cost of operating a gym, both including staff and then including all the other factors that go into operating a building. And that gets uh, built into um, an operating cost that would um, create an endowment going forward if the city were to say, we don't have the resources to operate a gym. Because right now, it appears to me that we're operating a gym um, at Coverly, essentially, uh, with staff making reservations and um, maintenance people fixing Coverly and all the other stuff that we have to do. So am I right to assume that or not, Darren? I think there'd be a lot more work we'd have to look into to make sure what those costs are. I don't think I can answer that one at this no. chair. I was just, I was asking you to, if you could answer the, you wouldn't operate the Coverly gyms and you would transfer those costs over to a new building. That's all. Yeah, possibly. I, mean, there's, I think the staff at Coverly are probably managing many things at the site. So, yeah. yeah. And then um, there, there is a formula that some people use to um, decide the costs of operating a building, operating a pool, operating a gym, there's a multiplier. So that, that's pretty much, pretty much available, so. Great. Okay, other questions, Jeff? That's Bye, all. Jeff. Thank you. 
No. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so in our um, research, we came up with things that uh, Jim needs. And let me just go through the, the list. Um, we're contemplating the space for three basketball size course courts. Um, sports that could be accommodated or would be our basketball, volleyball, pickleball, indoor soccer, badminton, and table tennis with appropriate lines on the floor and equipment storage. Um, restrooms, obviously changing rooms, but not including showers. Um, probably they could be optional administrative offices, exercise rooms, including uh, space for yoga, things like Zumba and the cardiac programs and a meeting room or two in classrooms. And so anybody else want to put something else on the list? Nope. Okay. Well, so I have a comment. I, I get worried about recommending specific amenities too early on in the process, because I think that that's something that would really benefit from community engagement and feedback on what the community wants or envisions in the gym. I think I agree with a lot of what Jeff said about needing more, sorry, Commissioner Chair Greenfield, um, it said about needing a bit more information. Um, and in, in that, I think that you could do like a dollar per square footage estimate of, of getting that information and then a range of sizes for the gym. But I just worry about specifying amenities too early on in the process um, in any sort of recommendation moving forward. Yeah, I, I think that um, the reason that we wanted to at least have a, a summary of what could go in a gym is just to have people understand what the vision was from the ad hoc for the gym. But certainly once community outreach started, um, it, it, this isn't cast in stone, it's meant to be flexible, so. One thing that worries me always is project creep, right? You <laughs> Everyone wants the Cadillac and the badminton people want badminton. And then we add, well, what about weightlifting? What about, and so you all of a sudden end up with something that's not buildable. So I am sensitive about specifying amenities right now. Okay, well, we could just save three basketball courts. How's that? <laughs> yeah, because whether the, the changing rooms have showers or not, that seems, that seems like a no brainer that they do. But why get into all that detail unless it has to do with square footage and you're going to make it from 25 million to 26 million or 25 and a half million? I don't think it's really relevant at this point. Okay, so um, I have one more question. Uh, and I, I agree with what Mandy said about uh, not, not getting too far into the details. I think this is great as, as a general vision. Uh, but has, have you given any thought to what type of space allocation there would be that would address the needs of youth versus adults versus seniors versus special needs? Obviously, there's going to be some overlap and, and shared space and, 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 and time sharing, uh, but it seems like there is going to be some dedicated, some, some spaces would be, need, need to be dedicated for specific activities. And, and I certainly... We, uh, community outreach and understanding the, the priorities of the community uh, is important, uh, but do you have any thoughts on how this plays out? You're talking about three gyms. Is that, would there be separate rooms besides that for uh, uh, sm smaller uh, scale activities? Uh, just wondering what your vision is on this. Yeah, that was pretty much our, our vision. If we have three basketball sized courts, then we can accommodate all of that list of indoor sports that we talked about. And then okay, in addition, so, so. we would contemplate a couple of classrooms, smaller exercise rooms um, that could be multi-purpose used for seniors or kids or um, adults even. Okay. And, this is, and you've used as a model some of the other private gyms that you've seen around here. We did, already. Jeff, maybe you can speak to that. Jeff Lemire. Yeah, we looked at the other gyms in the area and got some cost estimates um, and thought those were good models and good things to base it on. But you know, certainly as, as Mandy said, those are privately funded projects. We don't have a lot of examples of publicly funded projects, um, but we could also do a little more research into that with some 
uh, nearby cities, I'm sure, have some uh, facilities that would be worthwhile. But those privately funded gyms had some of those other things that uh, that the vice chair have mentioned. Uh, uh, they're not just purpose, right? David, could you repeat that? I, you got garbled. For, it might be my computer. Those private gyms are they single? Are they single purpose gyms, or do they have to deal with? All those other or, uh, uh, stakeholder groups, like the vice chair was saying. Yeah, um, the gyms serve a different groups. Some of the gyms, one of the gyms we looked at um, specifically serves a school, um, and so you know they're in, in there, and that's the gym that uh, is the Pinewood Gym. So like the Pinewood gym, the Castilea gym, the Menlo school gym, the Maples gym, those are private gyms. So those serve those private entities. Uh, but all of those gyms do serve multiple sports, for example, and multiple events. Um, the Burgess gym would be the one example that serves multiple stakeholders and the community. So that is the one public gym on the list, as opposed to the four private gyms that are school gyms. Um, but those are just gyms in our, in our area to serve as examples uh, for what we're looking at for space, for what we're looking at for uh, additional programming and additional uh, meeting rooms. But they all have to be ADA compliant and things like that. So uh, they have to have some of that, some of those features. Okay. <clears throat> So would you like to take a look at this? Um, let's see what time. Yeah, we're, we're using up a lot of the time that has been allotted. So I want to make sure everybody has a chance to um, comment. And I don't think we need to reiterate everything that's in the, the memo. Um, so Darren, do you want to put that motion up on the screen and see if people feel comfortable with uh, recommending anything going forward? Can you see my screen, Chair? I can see your screen, yes. Okay, any thoughts? So um, ask a question a different way. Does everybody on and the meeting, all the commissioners think that they could support um, this? One, one thing is it's kind of nebulous about funding. Uh, do we want to make it clear that this is going to be a privately funded or is that not necessary? I think our thoughts have always been that it would be privately funded um, in the vision of the junior museum, but I don't think that they have funding going forward. Darren, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I don't believe the operating ongoing operating costs have been um, finalized yeah. through. The, yeah. So um, I, I think that the the agreement that was used um, from the city and the junior museum is a model that we would have to make some changes to and some additions to. Um, but it's pretty much been my thought that since there's no money and no staff that we have to figure out a way for the community to fund this so that it would be privately funded. So should I, we, I, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. I, I think Keith's suggestion is great. That I, I think for council to, be able to support this, I think it would be uh, important for them to understand that we're envisioning this as a private funded gym project. And I, I think you could add privately funded right after the word, yeah.
does that uh, work for what you're suggesting, Keith? Well, I was just going to add something at the end that said the commission intends that this gym would be private, the construction and operation of this gym would be privately funded and that the commission should pursue funding sources, something like that. So are, is the ad hoc's intention that operation would be privately funded? And uh, so in, in, in addition to constru construction? I don't think Darren can sign up for operating a gym right now, can you? No. Yeah, so I think we, we'd have to raise enough money to not only build it, but have ongoing operating expenses. We don't know what those costs are, those the revenues and the expenses, because we don't have that information yet. That's right, we don't. Yeah. I would feel a little bit more comfortable if it wasn't as, uh, if we could soften it a little bit. And, and it, it's actually very similar to the bullet points I wrote down is asking council to support the, an initial kind of discovery phase or uh, a preliminary phase of the, of the gym by looking, getting that information on the operations, cost revenue, um, doing a demand assessment, like what uh, Vice Chair Greenfield was mentioning, um, keeping the possible locations in there I was fine with, and then the, the dollar per square foot rather than the specific gym amenities were sort of the four items that I had thought um, might be a good compromise. Um, and then I also think maybe setting, uh, because we're asking for council approval to utilize staff time and resources to support this phase, I would support putting a timeline out of, of it, on it um, and saying this preliminary phase will last one year and the committee, the commission will report back to council at that time with an update. Yeah, I think those are good suggestions. I'm good with that. I, I like the idea. I, I like the idea of a specific uh, uh, time horizon for this uh, authorization, essentially, uh, and 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 so. What, I know your suggestions were were multifaceted, but maybe at the end, maybe at the end, we had the uh, as Keith was suggesting the bit about uh, the. the the commission envisions that this will be privately, that the construction and operation will be privately funded, and and then say something about the, the, the timeline included with that as well, and then we can get back and talk about the details to include. It even goes so far as to say the feasibility for the gym would be based upon the assumption of privately funded construction and operation. Yeah, why don't we just say it that way? I like that, Manny. Would you like me to start editing, Chair, or what would you like? Would you mind, Darren? I, I don't mind at all. Um, can you feed me one more time? The... Okay, I, I have one to throw up front. The very first sentence, can we say the Parks and Recreation Commission supports investigating the plan? Investigating a plan. Okay. Does Mandy want to say what, say your uh, spiel again? I thought that was very good. Yeah, okay, so I only have bullet points. Sorry, Darren. <laughs> um, operations, costs, and revenue, Jim. Uh, demand assessment. And then possible locations. And I'm fine listing the two that the ad hoc. Um, had listed here. Um, they were, were they in this motion? I can't read it. I think so that's fine. Um, and then uh, construction costs on a dollar per square foot basis. I don't know if that's too detailed. And then at the end, we had um, said feasibility is based upon privately funded construction and operation. On uh, 
Right. Can you say the last part again? Feasibility is based upon private funding. Private, private privately funded construction and operation. Got it. Um, and I don't know if anybody was in support of the the one year horizon mm -hmm. and or if you wanted to change that at all. No, I would be in support of that, Mandy, because I don't I wouldn't want to see this drag out for four or five years and having the same discussion. Um, since we started the parts master plan in 2016, or since we, we adopted it, um, and this is the first sort of forward moving action we've done on the suggestion of a gym, I think it's good to have a, a year there. Here, do you mind if I share some thoughts on the, on the time period? Um, well, I, I understand and, and could see value in that. Um, one of the things I'm a little concerned about is we mentioned a couple of projects here, but there are many others that our staff is already working on. And so depending on the uh, amount of staff involvement in this investigation, there might be other priorities taking place that we, we might not be able to drop and pick this up. Um, it's a concern of mine, even if it's not my team, it might be public works engineering and they might not have availability within this time frame to do the necessary work. Um, I'm just worried we're going to hamstring staff and not be able to give the support that's necessary. That's fair, Darren. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay to take it out. Just that last sentence. How did the other commissioners feel? So are we, is, is the option to put a, a time limit or leave it open-ended? And are you suggesting we should leave it open-ended, Darren? Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I'm suggesting if you put a time limit on it and council says to do it, that means it becomes a priority and we very well may need to drop other things to, to get this done. I, um, I don't, sorry, I don't think that my, my intention was, it has to be done in a year. It was set it as a, so the council is only committing to a year of this and then it comes back with a report. And at that point they can offer to, then they could extend the process or take up the next steps. I just wanted to set clear benchmarks uh, moving forward. So there's a, a status update after within one year. Yeah. Or a status update uh, during calendar year 2020, calendar year 22. So, so we kind of have a, some duplicated language. We need to sort out how, how we're going to include things. When in the sentence it says the commission requests council direct staff and commission to review the assess, et cetera. Um, that, that that whole sentence is kind of duplicated with the sentence Mandy added with operation costs. I think. Uh, not necessarily. I think if you had said investigating a plan, design, construction, and ongoing support of a new public gym, and then at the bottom where it says operation costs, you can say this recommendation would include operation cost and revenue, demand assessment, et cetera. Well, we're, we're th saying things like locations twice and... Well, well, yeah, uh, oh, okay. You, you can remove words. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Mandy, was your, intent, was your intention to add, add that as a separate section? No, or? it was just the bullet points I was writing. Down. Right, no, no, I, <laughs> I see. Yeah. And, and I think we want to keep this as, as simple and uh, <laughs> so general, it's general it's slash flexible as we can. The sentence mm. above operations cost, can you add just one or two things to that sentence? Like demand assessment. He's got, it said, including location, site considerations, gym features and requirements, cost and funding timeline, and cost is, it would include operations costs. Uh, but the only thing that's missing is demand assessment. So if you just add demand assessment, you could take out that whole sentence about operations costs. Mm -hmm. So just put including location, site considerations, gym features, cost and funding timeline, demand assessment, 
Yeah, and then take out that whole next set of the bullet the operations points. cost. Uh, I, I think I think maybe maybe you, before you delete that, we, uh, up above change cost to uh, construction and operation construction and operation costs and operation costs. comma funding timeline uh, get rid of and do, do, we, need, do we want uh, revenue included somewhere uh, or that's that's just that's part of that, is that part of operation funding costs? that's part of operations costs and funding so well, maybe no it's not it is is the, the do we need timeline with funding? Uh, the staff uh, re, the staff request asks for that. Okay. So can we now get rid of operations cost and revenue sentence? Yeah, I think we can. Uh, not that. Not feasibility though. All right, leave that in. Does the feasibility sentence? prevent the bond measure because I know that was that was brought up as wanting to keep that door open. Do we want to mention it at this point or do we want to say feasibility for this initial phase is based on private funding versus bond measure because that's not that's something that's going to be evaluated in this first year. See that that's what I was worried about is that if you go with a bond measure, I would much rather that it go towards the cover uh, coverly plan which includes a gym. So this muddies that water if you bring that up and uh, about, I'm for that actually. How about feasibility currently assumes private, privately funded construction and operation. And, but you've already got that up above where it says privately funded gym project. We, 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 we I think we take that out because we're talking about construction and operation. Take what out? Privately funded where Darren has it highlighted. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll take that out. Yeah. Because because we have to clarify that it's yeah. Get rid of that comma. Uh do you want to specify something about investigating a bond measure or is that just? Well, the, the thing I'm wondering about the bond measure is that totally separate from this, totally separate from this, we should be looking at a bond measure for many different reasons. And I'm wondering if, if putting it in here, uh, Bond measures have such big overhead. There's such planning and yeah. polling and yeah. stuff. And, and they, they need to be they need to be detailed. I think if you put bond measure in it, uh, it, it, it decreases the likelihood that the city council will support this. I would well, agree. I would like to not have the bond measure included in this because um, I think it really hurts the project going forward. I, yeah, it might hurt donations too. Yeah, I do wish that, as I said before, that we have a separate discussion about a bond measure. And that would go, I'd want to find out from city council all kinds of questions about a bond measure. And uh, because I do think we need one. But this, you're talking about fast tracking. I don't think that bond measure and fast tracking can be said in the same sentence. <laughs> That's right. But I don't think that you should not talk about a bond measure some other way, some other place. And, and what does the city council expect us to do about a bond measure? So, so in other words, it, it's a, it could be a major focus for next, next year. A major focus for next year would be a bond measure. So should we say feasibility currently assumes? I think what you've got there is fine. Okay, fine. 
What, what do others think? Do you remember it? Okay. If I may, I, I would just um, suggest to not be too um, precise. I think you still have a lot of um, vetting to do. So just keep it, um, keep it open for future discussion among yourselves, but get this to, to, to council for now. So I would leave it as it is and not get too um, precise on what type of funding you're going to be looking at. So we should take the sentence out for now and just get it oh. to council. Oh, no. I mean, leaving it as is is better than going into saying things like uh, perhaps looking in a bond or whatever other method. So I would leave the bond out. Okay. That's too precise. The way that it is now is fine. Okay. Okay, so we have some more duplicity both before and after the shaded area. I think you uh, we're returning to city council with a recommendation and when your status update during calendar year 2022. So the, the sentence of maybe we get delete the and return to city council with a recommendation, delete that since that sentence is too long already. Arguably. I think you're right. Uh, uh, but that's a re return to provide a status update, provide a status update to city council during calendar year 2022. I think that could be the last sentence. So after feasibility is based on or before? I, I would put it after the feasibility personally. Okay. Yeah, I I like having the status update be the last sentence. Yeah, maybe a status update will be provided to City Council. That's what you already have. Okay, I'm ready for that. Do we want to include skate park gym and 10.5 acres under prioritization? I think it would be simpler if we just omitted that. Because there, as Darren suggested, there may be there may be other projects. And as long as you keep in the prioritization of projects. Yeah, yes, it's just yes, it was just I'm suggesting to getting rid of the parenthetical expression. Sure, it's fine. I'm okay with this. The, uh, what's the difference between location and site considerations? To... Well, we I think it's because we started out with the three things that we needed to decide. One was the location, one was the what's in a gym, and one the third one is the cost and funding mechanism. So site consideration should be taken out? It could be. Okay. Do you like that removed chair? Well, actually, I think it probably needs to stay in because um, there there should be sort sort of a balance between what what happens to this site if we don't use it. What if we use this site? What what are the considerations? What are the parking things? So. I could go either way on that, as as long as this is a flexible and general. I, I think it's confusing as it's written, location, maybe location considerations or site considerations, but not both. If I read that, I'm not sure what it means, but that's, oh, okay. well, I'm, that interested, I'm interested in other people's uh, thoughts on that. I think it could mean anything from 
neighbors, compatible uses to soil considerations, if it's a, a Baylands area. So I, I would like to keep it in. Okay. Is it is it location and site considerations or just? Legal? I think it could be because if you're talking about one site and it has a vernal pond in it, that's a different thing than a location. So. But I'd say leave it in the way it is. Yeah, thank you for the examples. I had no idea what that meant. The previous line, the review and assess and conduct, do we need all three of those? Can we trim that a little? Oh, good idea. Just to, just to conduct public outreach. Well, we need to either review or assess or analyze or. Okay, pick one and take it out. Assess. You want to remove assess? No, let's remove review. Okay. Uh, Instead of including, would that really be evaluating location, site consideration? Or is this including mean including in the outreach? It's including the assessment and outreach. It, it's what's covered under the assess, assess and outreach. And at the outreach. Okay. Are we ready to make a motion? Yes. Yeah, I just does, does, does staff or our council liaison have any further recommendation? Uh, I don't believe I do at this time. Looks good to me. Thank you. Okay, is somebody ready to make a motion? Uh, I'll move to make a motion that the Parks and Rec Recreation Commission supports investigating a plan design and construction of a new public gymnasium. I second. Lam, could you do a voice vote, please? Yes. Chair Cribs? Yes. Vice Chair Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Lamare? Yes. Commissioner Rechdahl? Yes. And Commissioner Brown? Yes. Chair, that's a 6 0 vote. Well, that's very good. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm encouraged by the motion and by the support and by the questions, all of which are very good. And um, I have a lot of confidence in our community that we can um, get this done um, in the right way with the right process, answering all these questions. So thank you all for your careful consideration of this. I really appreciate it. Oh, th thank you to the ad hoc and, and uh, the chair for, for driving this. Okay. Great, so that uh, leads us to, let me see. Well, we got to where I thought we would be at uh, 10 o'clock, a little bit later than I thought. Um, uh, the tentative agenda for December 14th. Yeah, thanks chair. Um, we've got the Foothills Nature Preserve policies as an action item. Uh, I need to confirm with, Adam, but he had discussed the possibility of having the court usage on the December 14th agenda and potentially CIPs. I also need to confirm that with both the ad hoc and LOM. Um, LOM, any thoughts on CIPs for December 14th? Uh, I think we can, uh, because internally as staff, we would have had this discussion definitely by then. And um, for sure, yes, we could uh, share with um, the ad hoc prior to then. 
Yeah, this would be ad hoc, and I'm I'm talking about an agendized presentation to the full commission. I think December might be premature for a report, um, being that they're moving pieces, and I I hesitate because I, I think the pieces would move if we were to present them so early, and that's not solidified. Yeah, you know, um, let's, we'll discuss this a little bit more detail. My fear is we wait too long and we miss giving the, the full commission a chance to weigh in. It's, I, I've missed the boat before. And so I want to err on the side of um, even if it's incomplete and it's in flux, it gets publicly vetted and the commission gets a chance. So we're going to do our best to make that happen. And uh, we'll consult more with the ad hoc when we meet with them hopefully next week. Thank you. Um is there any way to do anything about the skate park? Is it premature? Do you want to wait till January, Darren? Yeah, thanks, Chair. That's a good question. I, I want to move forward with it very soon. I'd love to have it on December 1. I'm, um, I've got that request in to one of my colleagues to see if they can help lead that next step. Um, sort of contingent on that. Um, I. I loathe to keep saying I'm short on staffing and not enough staff to do things. Unfortunately, that one sort of falls into that camp and I apologize for making- I don't think there's any need to apologize. I think we've said it a number of times in all these discussions today about budget and staff, so. Yeah, well, yeah. I appreciate your patience. And then uh, Chair, although I know we're not talking about the December one, but just to make sure we've got it on people's radar, we were thinking for the January agenda, that would be the updates on golf and aquatics, mm -hmm. um, tree protection, and potentially uh, the Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Plan finally coming back to the commission after a very long delay. Oh. Um, and I look forward to meeting with the vice chair and chair to talk about agenda planning uh, very soon in more detail. Okay. Um, can we get an can we get an update on the uh, um, the Baylands uh, signage project? Because that's glad. coming up pretty soon. I, I'd be glad to in incorporate that in my next uh, department report. Okay, that looks like looks like a, an agenda for December, Darren. Great. And uh, maybe we can get together with vice chair next week and talk about it before you want to do it before Thanksgiving or next week's a short week for you. Uh, before Thanksgiving would be great for me if that's all right with you too. Yeah. Great. Jeff, can you do that? Or are you out of town? Um, leaving town. We, we, we can talk offline. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Okay. Well then. Chair, we'll chair Cribs, Lydia has her hand up. I know I was just going to ask her if she had anything that she wanted to say, and you beat me to it. Um, from this, uh, Council Member Koo. Thank you, Chair. Um, for the December meeting, it falls on a policy and services meeting date, and so I will not be um, participating in the Parks and Rec uh, Commission meeting. Um, and given it, I think it's the last meeting, I just, uh, and I don't know if next year I'll be assigned back to PRC. So I just wanted to say that it was a absolutely enjoyable year being li liaison to the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, like I said earlier, and what you reminded me, Chair, is that it is a very fun committee, but the amount of work that you all do is tremendous. And so I just want to say a great big thank you for all the work that you do do. Well, thank you for that. And I think uh, I know personally, I've been very happy and pleased that we have had a liaison who is so interested and shows up at every meeting because that's not always the case. And um, it's really very helpful. So thank you very much for your commitment to that. And any other commissioners comments? Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say the same thing that I really appreciate uh, your participation and it makes uh, um, it makes our job easier and it also uh, ups our game to, uh, to have you here and thank you I want to make sure that when you go through this arduous process of finding new parks and rec commissioners uh, that 
the cohesiveness of this group and the the the, the calmness and the patience and the uh, um, is really an important aspect that needs to be uh, encouraged and um, and promoted. So um, I really appreciate having you uh, participate. Well, Commissioner Moss, thank you for all your years of service too. What are you going to do with all your time now? Yes, exactly. <laughs> And Darren Lamb, thank you so much for having me also. I was just Maybe I'll say, be back, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Ku. It's been wonderful having you, and we're very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Ku, for your en engagement and, and support to, well, for the past two years. It, it, it's, it's, uh, in my time on the commission, we haven't had uh, the, the same council member uh, repeat a term, and it, it's it's, it's been great. Thank you. Well, you know, the nature um, environment is very important to me. I, I, I really love it. Um, so I've learned a lot being on this uh, commission and I've enjoyed all the moments. So thank you. Thank you for your service and enthusiasm. It's much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Okay. So if there are no other comments, I think. Um, um, or I have. I have some other comments if we're on the comment section. We're on the we're done with the agenda and the announcement section too. Yes, okay. comments and announcements. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, um, the Searsville uh, Dam uh, project has been uh, ongoing for about ten years, trying to figure out what to do with uh, that dam in. Um, in uh, the Jasper Ridge um, um, Preserve in, at Stanford. And the reason it's important for this group is uh, two reasons. One is it, um, it's a good model for the Buckeye Creek project because even though Stanford is very, very, very wealthy, they are going to be going for federal and state grants to uh, work on this uh, project and it's a major flood control project that will affect everything downstream, half of which is Palo Alto, and all the way into the Baylands. And so, um, um, if they remove this dam, it has major implications for flood control, which is exactly the same issues that the Buckeye Creek project is dealing with. So, it'll be a good model for us to watch over this next year or two. Uh, to see how they get their grants and uh, and how quickly they can move and all of the agencies that they need to deal with, including the joint powers uh, group. So I just wanted to mention that. Second thing is I, I wanted to mention that I really, really appreciated the uh, JMZ tour that I had and I'm uh, looking forward to the um, to the, the opening and, and thank you, Darren, for the uh, statistics about how uh, well received it, it is. Um, so that was one thing. And then the, the third thing is that you talked about resurfacing the Coverly tennis courts <clears throat> in the spring. And with that, there will be demand for lighting in the, in the fall and winter of 2022-23. And I would encourage you to see if there's some way, like we have temporary lights at Coverly Field, that we find a way to uh, get the Tennis Players Association to help fund uh, the placement of temporary lights for the Co Coverly Tennis Courts. Um, so that was my third comment. That's it. Thank you. Any other comments or announcements from other commissioners? Darren, from you, from staff? Nothing for me, Chair. OK. So before we uh, move to adjourn, I'd like to well uh, wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving and uh, tell everybody that I'm thankful to be serving on this commission with all of you and certainly thankful for, for the staff. Darren, thank you for your work 
certainly tonight and always, and Lam as well. So um, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And um, is there a motion to adjourn? I so move. I second. And a second? I second. Okay. I guess we're adjourned. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody.